Thank you, Beth. Welcome everyone to the um, May 9th, um, 2022 work session. We'll start with roll call. Beth? Smith. Hi, here, sorry. Becker. Here. Welch. Here. Blairly. Here. McCoy. Here. Leighton and Warren. Here. Mills. Here. Did we get Nancy? Yeah. Okay. We, um, we're, there's six here and Nancy is remote. Nancy Welch is remote. Um, and we're going to move on now to the open forum. Are there any, is there anyone who wants to speak? Okay, it looks like there isn't anyone tonight. So we're going to move on to um, operations. Um, and that is going to be facilitated by Don Smith. Okay. We are gonna start out with our um, defeasance summary. This will come to the board to be voted on at our next regular board meeting on the 23rd of May. And I believe we have Mike Clark from Baird here. I am here. Thank you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Does, does everyone have a copy of the, the defeasance summary? Yeah, it's, it's posted in the board docs for everyone. Okay, great, great. So um, yeah, this is, uh, for those who are not familiar with the defeasance, it's a pre-funding of districts existing debt, a little different than prepayment since the payment won't take place for four years yet. Uh, but the, um, but the, the idea is the district was able to levy additional funds in the 21-22 fiscal year because uh, of declining revenue limit authority and, and increased state aid, an amount sufficient to pay off the remainder of the Fund 39 debt. Fund 39 debt is a referendum approved debt. So included in the levy this last fall the, approved by the board uh, was um, 17.8, just under $17.9 million that will pre will pre-fund the payments, but legally the district will met its obligation, will have no, no longer have any outstanding Fund 39 debt um, that I'll have to pay going forward. Uh, obviously, you know, that plays into some of the planning the district's doing as far as this fall, um, but the, the money will be deposited to an escrow account. Um, it, it'll pay off um, the, um, 2017 bonds and the 2019 bonds. And as a result, um, it'll save the taxpayers approximately, we haven't finalized the escrow numbers yet, because um, you can, uh, so we'll save about $890,000 we're currently estimating. That savings comes about by paying the debt off on the call date. And also the district, the, the funds, once they de are deposited in the escrow account, uh, they will earn interest. Now, you're limited to government securities. And one good thing about the increasing interest rate environment, you're actually going to earn a decent chunk of money in there, much more than we anticipated last fall when the levy was set. Um, but um, so saving $890,000. The district, you know, through various uh, defeasances, various refinancing, has saved over $2 million in terms of uh, taxpayer dollars. And again, the eight, eight, 890 we're estimating is purely taxpayer relief. Uh, it cannot be used for any other purpose, that levy authority. So that's kind of the overview. We have the steps. Uh, we've done this multiple times within the district. And so um, the, uh, for those of you who've been around, you've been through this process before. Uh, this will come to the board on the, uh, May 23rd uh, for board action. There'll be a resolution on the board uh, agenda to, to take action on. Um, but the second page of the document gets into the details. You can see the 17 and 19 uh, issues um, kind of highlighted in a salmon color pink, depending on, on what your screen is showing you. Um, but those 
those funds will, will those payments will be funded and will become the responsibility of the escrow agent who the district has used associated bank in the past. And again, generating taxpayer savings of over $893,000. Now, after this, the district will not have the, the option of doing a defeasance because you will no longer have any existing debt. And unless the district is able to generate some additional levy authority, you know, they, the district will see a substantial drop in its uh, levy and resulting tax rate. So with that, I'll conclude my comments and take any questions if there are any. Okay, are there any questions? This is a reminder, even with the additional levy into Fund 39, the district's tax rate did decrease last, last fall. So. Okay. Oh, sorry, Andrew. Um, I just wanted to see, we have, um, and it's obviously good when we can do a, a defeasance because it's a net positive financial thing to do. Uh, how does this fit into, you know, over the years, we've tried to keep consistent with bringing in, you know, I guess what you might save on a, for the size of our district as a kind of a medium size um, referendum as parts of the uh, Fund 39 drop off. Um, here, we'd be covering all of the Fund 39. Does that still, I guess, does that fit in well to this strategy since in the past, I don't remember us bringing down the fund 39 this much before with defeasance, taking it all the way off the table. Yeah, it, 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 it going forward, um, as I stated, the only way the district would be able to continue the practice is if, if some a, a new debt would be put in place and that only could be done through referendum. Um, you know, I know the district's having conversations uh, in regards to the fall of 22. Um, and if, if that's successful, if that's ultimately what the board decides to do, it would have that option again. There was a combination of things this year that kind of, um, let me back up even a little further than this year. Um, in, in scheduling out these defeasances at one point, obviously we anticipated the district going to referendum sooner than, than, it, than it ultimately may end up being and a lot of factors in there, you know, COVID being one of them. So obviously, you know, a, a 2020 referendum probably, you know, may have been slotted, but obviously as many other districts did, um, you know, that really wasn't part of the planning at that time, too many other issues going on. So as a result of that, you know, the district did defeasances those years, paid down the debt, did a bigger one this year. And the primary driver for that is the state budget. The, the money that flowed into the state budget for schools was focused on property tax relief and it wasn't spendable dollars. So it lowered the district's taxes and tax rate substantially. And so the district was faced with a situation and we looked at different scenarios in terms of, do we break this into two pieces? But given some of the longer term planning uh, things that the district uh, thought, you know, how things might play out in the future, it was decided that, um, that leveling the amount sufficient to pay off the debt uh, um, was the best approach for the district given kind of the, some of the future planning things that it's looking at. So. Um, you know, hopefully the district, you know, if it does choose to go to referendum this fall is successful. I think this sets you up really well to be successful, to be debt free and, and to save all the money the district did um, in paying the debt down early through defeasances or refinancings that we've done over the last several years. Um, you know, it, it, it puts the district in a good position um, to go to the voters um, and kind of build back a little bit of debt while it's looking at maybe some longer term, bigger, you know, longer term planning issues. So, but again, bottom line, this will be the last defeasance the district does unless it issues some new debt. Okay, any other questions? Nancy, are you good? 
Okay. Well, Mike, thank you so much for joining us. This will be um, on our agenda at our next board meeting to vote on. Okay. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Thanks. Okay. Next on the agenda is a facility summary or survey report that's also attached in board docs. And we have Joe Donovan who will be um, reviewing this with us. Hello, Joe. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to be with you uh, this evening and uh, appreciate the opportunity to work with you once again. And I, I'll just, I need to apologize in advance. Um, hopefully I just had the coughing fit done um, during the last presentation. I've had a cold, thankfully it's not COVID, but um, I apologize in advance if I cough or need to take a, a glass of water here. Um, just really very grateful for the opportunity to speak with you tonight about a recently conducted um, survey. Um, as noted, my name is Joe Donovan, um, and our firm is the Donovan Group. We've, we've had the great pleasure of working with the district over many years, including doing a number of surveys. The survey that was conducted and that I'm going to review uh, with you in a moment really kind of builds on um, some of that work with you. And so I'm going to start um, really reviewing the document at a high level. It's in your board packet. I'm going to start with the methodology in a moment. I'm gonna go quickly. I'm very happy to take um, some questions in the end and I'm gonna have kind of four key uh, thoughts at the end after I review the survey. So with that, um, I will um, jump in. Again, for those of you who have been on the board for some time, our methodology is very similar uh, this time, almost exactly this time as what we've done uh, in the past. Um, the survey was uh, done using um, our online survey system. Um, uh, respondents came in and could take the survey online. Paper copies were available. Um, uh, generally don't talk a lot about it, but I should mention that we go to some lengths to ensure that people have an opportunity to take the survey once, but not more than once. Um, again, to encourage residents to take the survey, the district sent a postcard uh, to the community and also the district used some of its other channels to encourage and invite people to take the survey. The survey was open from the 18th of April to the 29th of April. One thing that I should note, uh, just as I always do with this type of survey, is that this survey is based on what we call a convenient survey. That is, we want everyone in the district community to participate. We don't use a sample or a stratified sample. And so um, it, it's not a scientific survey in that we don't um, do regression analysis or predictive analysis or, um, or calculate error. Um, that said, as I'm going to mention in a second, our respondent pool is very solid and we feel very good about that. A total of 3,432 community members completed the survey online. Um, this included 62 respondents who completed the survey um, in Spanish. Now in a moment, board members, I'm going to give you some numbers. And again, I'm going to go at a high level, but it's important, I think, for me to describe the different ways that I'm going to present the data. Um, and so, um, and, and by the way, we're redoing our, uh, our, our survey report. So this is kind of the, uh, this is the last of the old way of our presenting this, this data. So it's going to be a little clearer. I apologize for this. It can be a little confusing. For each number, for each question, you're going to see the first set of data as you go from the left is going to be the all respondent number. That all respondent number is just as it sounds, it's the percentage of that represents the entire respondent pool. Um, again, an all respondent uh, group. The second set of data, which if you print it in color or looking at it in color, uh, it's blue, the second set, includes responses from a, what we call a comparison group. These are district residents that are not currently parents of preschool or school age students. This group is not employees and they're not students. Um, so the comparison group um, can include parents of former district students, but it's not parents of students who are currently in the school. I'm going to stop there and I'm going to, to um, note why we have a comparison group. We've been doing this for a very long time and whenever we do surveys for a referendum, we always know that people who are parents, employees, people who are the closest to the school tend to be, tend to favor a, a referendum. 
whereas at, at rates that are higher than people who maybe aren't as close to the school district. And so that comparison group allows us to understand and allows us to measure maybe what people who, again, don't have a, a connection to the school district may think. Now, one final set of numbers, you're gonna see this for some of them, it's going to be a weighted group. Um, this is something that we just started doing. In most communities, when we see on election day, 70% of people who go to the polls do not have a connection to the school district. 70% of people are people, I always use my mom as an example. It's been a very long time since her children were in school, but you, you, you better believe that she's gonna be voting on election day. And so she's in the comparison group. And so we create a weighted number that's 70, that, that's weighted um, higher um, and it's 70-30 for our comparison group versus our parents and others who would be outside the comparison group. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. I will tell you that again, the, because this is not a scientific survey, uh, survey it's, not a, it's not a poll that's using a scientific sample, it can't be predictive. I will tell you that just about in every situation, including when we've done survey work with the district in the past, um, it ends up being fairly close to reality. So with that, I will just jump in. Um, I am on page three if you're following along. We start with what is your age? One of the things that's really important, I'll just say off the bat, that we were very pleased to see is when we see in our all respondent group, 15.24% of all respondents um, were 65 and older. That is remarkable and it's, it's terrific because the hardest group that we have are people who, again, don't have a strong connection to the school district. And so that we receive 15.24 uh, is outstanding. Um, the next question is where do you reside? Again, this uh, largely mirrors as we understand the population of the school district, fairly consistent with what we've seen before. Going on to page four, how long have you lived in the school district? Again, this generally mirrors our age question. Um, in this question, again, we usually have underrepresentation for people who are at the upper end of the limit here, in this case, more than 30 years. We have great representation there. In some cases, in this one, it would have been nice maybe to have a few more at fewer than 10 years, but that's not a worry of ours. Again, board members, we have a very good respondent pool. The next question, question number four, is what we call a sorter question. This is a question that we've asked uh, with your, um, uh, um, with, with uh, members of your community many times before. And we ask them using kind of an opportunity to check different um, options, their, their characteristics from if they have school age children, if they have preschool age children, if they have children who currently attended the district, children who open enrolled in another district, grandchildren, whether they've attended, whether they're a community member who's never had a child in the district, whether they're currently a student, an employee, or in, or in some cases, other. Here again, you're going to see, um, just as we just about always do, that we have strong representation from people who have um, uh, school-aged children, and as you'll see in a moment, children in the district. But again, this suggests a good, healthy respondent pool. Question number five gives us a sense of where um, the children uh, go to school. Again, it's our understanding this, this roughly reflects um, um, reality, what the universe is in the district. Um, no big surprises there. Um, starting with six, um, this always is a very important question, right? I'm satisfied with the Green Bay Area School District. Here's 69% of respondents and more than 64% of the comparison group um, said that they were satisfied with the school district. I will stop there and say, these are very strong numbers. We have seen over COVID that these numbers um, with districts um, have gone down. These are very solid. Um, also, we only had 7% of all respondents and 11% said that they strongly disagreed. So again, we always have work to do, but again, these numbers are, are better than we typically see. Number seven is a question, where do people get um, their information about the school district? Of course, if you were to add all of these, this is going to be over 100% because people could choose more than one. Um, one thing that I always like to note um, here, again, nothing terribly surprising, um, but I always find that it's interesting to look at the difference between newspaper readership for our all respondent group at 22.55 versus 44.39 for our um, a comparison group. So again, 
We tend to see local newspaper readership being higher, especially among um, our uh, older residents, but newspaper is still a very important piece. But I will also add that 29% of your comparison group um, gets news about the school districts through social media. So again, an important piece here. One thing board members that I always like to note is to keep in mind that um, sometimes those social media numbers and sometimes the district mailings are a little bit inflated because people would have learned about the survey through social media or through district mailings. But these are, these are about what we, we would expect and I think consistent with what we've seen over time. Number eight um, is a question, again, that we've asked before, how familiar are you with the district's facility needs? Um, this I think is very telling. 76% of your all respondent group and a similar um, number of your comparison group indicated that they were well-informed or at least had some familiarity. This is a very good sign. Um, and it's in part a good sign board members because this is one of those questions where we have seen through the turbulence of COVID-19 that people in some districts, especially those comparison group members have lost touch with their school district. Um, your respondent group seems to be, to be well-connected here. So again, solid numbers there. Um, the 23% for each um, shows that you know, there's some work to do um, if you were to move forward with a referendum. At this point, some information is shared about the district's facility needs. Here I'm on page seven um, at, at uh, question nine. Um, and some information is shared about the district's facility needs. And here we used um, a five point scale. This is again, consistent with what we've done with surveys in the district before. Um, more than 83% of our all respondent group and nearly 76% of the comparison group indicated that they would support a referendum to address deferred, delayed or deferred maintenance um, facility needs. Very strong support. Um, I will tell you that I don't always love, we've been doing it forever this way, and, and I think that it works here. Um, and I, and, and it's, there's value, I think, in, in having good, strong longitudinal data. But I encourage you on, on question number nine, um, that no opinion, look at how low that no opinion is across the board. Um, 4.8 for our all respondent group, only 4.93 for our comparison group. Um, so people aren't saying, you know, I don't have an opinion about this. People are very happy to, to weigh in. Strong support um, for a referendum. 10, I would support a referendum that includes projects to include spaces in secondary schools that include renovations to classrooms, music rooms, auditoriums, et cetera. Upgrades could include seating, lighting, sound systems, et cetera. And that corresponded with some information. Again, nearly 83% of all uh, respondents would support a referendum that includes projects to improve space in secondary schools, um, renovations to classrooms, music rooms, et cetera. Um, our comparison group drops a little. Um, that's, that's usually, we, we often do see um, support drop faster with our comparison group but it's still at 72%. That's a very strong number. Question number 11, I would support a referendum that includes projects to improve locker rooms, weight rooms, concession stands, tennis courts, track and baseball, softball fields, et cetera. Upgrades could include bleachers, lighting, sound systems, et cetera. So here, 70% of our all respondent group would support a referendum that would include those items. Our comparison group drops to 56%. Again, that's still, of course, majority, um, but you see a pretty sizable dip there. Um, I will tell you that usually we see when it, it, it's, a, it's typically that we step these referendum questions like this, uh, we typically see more of a loss um, between those two questions. Typically it's a 20 point loss or more, and we don't have that here. Again, good numbers. Um, lower than what we saw for the previous question. 12, I would support a referendum that adds turf fields to Preble and West um, to provide equity and greater access to the fields for students, athletes, um, and community organizations. Uh, for this, if we combine again, strongly in agree and agree, we're at 67% of all respondents compared to 58% for comparison group members, strong support. 13, I would support a referendum that adds turf to West High School and makes stadium improvements, even though the property is owned by the city. 56% um, of all respondents 
um, and 52% of the comparison group said that they would support it. So again, when we start getting to, you know, um, for that comparison group close to, uh, close to the 50%, um, you know, we, we really start paying attention. We pay attention to all of them. But again, you can see how, again, the, the support drops. Um, as an aside, I think that um, from, a, from a survey uh, um, person standpoint, the survey is acting as it should, right? We're, that's maybe not be terribly surprised that we would see some support um, drop at that point. Number 14, I would support a referendum that upgraded, replaced older playground equipment. We're back up to significant support, 84% for all respondents, 73% for the comparison group when we combine the strongly and agree. Uh, and, agree. Um, and again, our no opinion for all of these questions, very, uh, very low except for on 12, on number 13. Look at how, again, going back to the turf fields at, at um, West High School, much higher than they were for the other categories. We'll go back to 15. I would support a referendum that upgraded, replaced older park uh, playground equipment that's located in the city park. And 85% for our all respondents, 64% for our comparison group. Um, 16, we're almost done here. I would support a referendum that improved district owned uh, in city owned playgrounds by adding ADA accessibility equipment and poured in place rubber playground surfaces. 82% for all respondent groups, 73% for our comparison group. One last question, one last item that was um, included in the survey and we, we, we uh, often uh, do that with the survey is that we allow for an open-ended question at the end of the survey where we just say, hey, please provide additional feedback uh, for the Board of Education here um, for this particular question, we spend a lot of time looking at these open respondent uh, questions. Again, we didn't have as much participation as we typically do. Keep in mind um, that we had, what, um, 3,400 people take the, to, uh, start the survey. Um, and this, is, this was not a required question. 750 people used the opportunity to provide some information. We did not see strong themes but a few what we would call um, more minor themes were considering using the capital maintenance budget to address these issues rather than a referendum. Uh, that's, that's something, that, again, that we see um, you know, fairly often. A smaller um, group um, wanted some additional uh, project added, such as um, auditorium upgrades, leaky roofs, mental health supports for students and staff, and some special education needs. Um, there were as a minor theme, um, concerns about too much focus on sports. And again, a minor theme about trying to address these challenges with rising inflation, the war um, that, that it, it, you know, that we've seen. And again, that, that's increasingly becoming um, an item that we're seeing um, on all of our survey results. Board members, before I, before I turn things over and ask for your questions, the, the, there are maybe four kind of big takeaways, um, if I could that um, I might suggest. Again, as I've noted, strong support uh, for a referendum um, across the board. Um, not, as, not the kind of what we would call turbulence that we often see um, in kind of this, this, this um, end of, hopefully the end of the pandemic that we're seeing in, in some districts. These numbers looked, frankly, and the responses looked a lot like they were when we've done previous surveys for the district. Uh, so not not significant difference. I'm I'm hoping that um, maybe this is the may, maybe this is the, um, the the light that we've been looking for in in, in as it relates to uh, getting past some of the the turbulence that we're seeing in districts where we do survey work. Um, I would say that the number of responses is consistent with our 2016 and 2019 surveys, and I would say very very positive response to. Um, again, the, the improvements that you've, that you've outlined. I know you have a busy agenda, so uh, forgive me for going super fast, um, but I'd be very happy to take any questions that, that uh, you may have. I think this was great. I appreciate you going very fast because we do have a very full agenda, but I think you did a really thorough job in walking through everything for us, so I appreciate it. Um, Thank you. Any questions? You're good, Nancy. Okay, I think this was very good. Thank you so much, Joe, for joining us tonight.
Thanks for the opportunity to work with you. Have a great evening, everyone. You too, thanks. Goodbye. Okay. And now we have Chad here for the Safe Walk and Bike Annual Report. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I'm Chad Jensma, Director of Transportation. And last year I was able to provide an update uh, for the Safe Walk and Bike Plan. And this year I'm um, grateful to do that again. We do that on an annual basis. And uh, attached to the board agenda, you'll see a copy of the, uh, the actual report. It's just a high level summarization of what kind of happened. I just wanna start out and give a little bit of an overview uh, again this year of what this is and just a couple of high points from, the, from this past year. Um, so in the, um, in the report, you'll find um, a number of different things, but again, uh, really the vision of this group is to provide equitable options that empower all people to walk and bike in our community. So it's not just for the school, but it's a collaborative effort between many different agencies. Um, and that would include um, the district, the city. Um, we have technical experts, nonprofit agencies involved, elected officials. Um, and we really try to implement the five E's, education, encouragement, engineering, enforcement, and evaluation um, in, the, in the plan itself. All looking through the uh, equity lens, again, um, and we really try to um, uh, work for all, all of the community. Um, this was something in 2019 that was passed unanim unanimously by the school board, along with um, this Green Bay City Council. So it's just been a lot of uh, effort and work um, that was brought um, forward uh, prior to my arrival here. So I've been able to uh, move it along or be part of, and unfortunately the last couple of years with COVID, my hope is that in the future, as we move um, into uh, more of a non-COVID environment, we'll be able to get more um, events and in-person things done, but I am proud to uh, report what we have tonight. Um, so one of the offshoots, uh, just to make mention, last week, Wednesday, um, May 4th, we had our district uh, bike to school day and we had some involvement. Um, and again, we're just getting things kind of um, going again. And um, one of the schools, MacArthur, had um, a couple of the TV, local TV stations even come through and uh, do some interviews and kind of do some of those things. We've got one of the middle schools uh, going to be looking at next week, um, picking up and just kind of working with their group on kind of a um, school um, drive on that. So it's been encouraging and I hope for good weather for them next week also. Um, okay, so one of, the, one of the highlights was that there, um, we added, there were, they added and upgraded all the pedestrian accommodations um, at se seven, seven signaled intersections along West Mason Corridor, uh, running from the Fox River to Interstate 41. And what this uh, provided was the push buttons and countdown timers at all of those locations. Um, so it's a, a huge safety um, improvement for a real busy corridor um, for those that are using, using that for this uh, type of transport. Um, also, there's been uh, insula installation of um, the RRFBs, they're called Rectangular Rapid Flashing Beacons. And you see those in different areas to draw attention. It's um, one of the most highly um, effective tools to help um, safely get uh, pedestrians across roads. So that's been great. And there is four significant areas that I'm just gonna quick highlight. Uh, Baird Street at the intersection of Stewart Street, which is near Washington Middle School. So that's a, a nice impact um, for our students. And, and parents and staff and anyone who's using that area. Um, <clears throat> along with um, 9th Street um, at Gross Avenue. And that's um, basically in the Beaumont Elementary area. So it's really a useful tool there also, um, helping aid students as they are in a non-bus walk area to get to school to and from. Uh, just the other, other areas, just as a quick note, uh, Dulcman Street at Murphy Drive, um, and then North Irwin Avenue at Bay Beach Road. And, and obviously that's near the Bay Beach Amusement Park. 
Um, Wello, uh, the second item here that I just want to quick cover, Wello is a nonprofit organization um, big in a number of different things for the wellness of the area. Um, they um, use what they consider um, fraudger events, and that's kind of bringing law enforcement from the area together to highlight a couple different dates. They did it one date in June, July, and August. So at three different occasions, they really tried to um, bring the enforcement and bring an awareness to, um, to drivers. And that was um, something that was very successful where they were able to talk and, and bring forward that message to a number of people. Um, the other piece with, with Wello I just wanted to draw attention to is that they, they were named a, a finalist for the 2021 Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Culture of Health. Um, and it's one of the nation's largest philanthropy um, devoted to health. And uh, this is their most prestigious community award. Um, so, and part of the reason I bring it up is because the reviewers ultimately pointed out that the innovative partnership between the city of Green Bay, the Green Bay Area Public Schools and <clears throat> the community collaborators uh, that developed this, this plan that's in front of us uh, was a major factor in that designation. So I just think we can uh, certainly um, join, join with them in that uh, accomplishment that they were able to receive that. The other item um, that kind of, it's looked at at like bicycles and um, in the community, you'll see a number of uh, e-scooters parked along the roads. So I just wanted to quick highlight that because I know that's a, a real big community item that a lot of people see these scooters parked in different spots. And quite frankly, um, a lot of us don't have the understanding of what exactly is going on with some of those. Um, they're from the, the bird, it's called a bird company and you download an app um, and you can put money on it and you scan it with your phone and there's some different things. But when you do that with the app, it allows you to um, utilize it for a certain period of time for different costs and whatnot. And then you can park it in designated park zones. So you see them in different places. And, you know, if you're like me, your mind will say, well, why did they park it there? Well, they're designated park areas or they left it in a spot that they weren't supposed to, but they have the record of the person that was using it. So they can, you know, talk with them and, and instruct and educate um, or, and or if it ultimately happens too often, they can, um, you know, revoke their privilege to do that. Um, so that's just a little bit about that. Um, last year, a couple of numbers, there was over 28,000 um, rides, and they, which is quite a high number, I thought. And um, there was 41,000 miles that was covered with these e-scooters. Um, so that was a pretty neat feat. Um, so I think that's just really great for our community. Um, this summer, they plan <clears throat> with um, COVID um, down, they plan to bring, bring the e-bikes back. I guess it started with the e-bikes and, and they kind of focused on the scooters. So they'll have both of those as options. Um, and then um, just as a last note on these scooters, they're to use the bike lanes. They're basically like a bicycle. Um, so they're not to be on sidewalks, uh, they're adhered by uh, just like a bicyclist would. And just to close, a significant focus of the safe walk and bike plan is the continued evaluation of our collective efforts as a community. Uh, the, the committee will continue to produce annual reports and I'll come before you each year just to give you an update. Um, just kind of talking about some of the accomplishments, the opportunities that might be coming. Um, the plan, again, is supporting the people who live, work, learn, play, and visit our community. Um, and the, uh, this plan also is going before the plan commission tonight. And next week, it'll go to the city council just for an informational update. So it hits all three different groups. Um, so I just appreciate your time. So thank you. Now you have Eric on here as a representative from the school board, do we need to replace him with a current member or? That's a great question. I did see that also as I was reviewing the, um, uh, the report. I will, uh, I'll talk with them. He uh, was unable to make many of the meetings, um, but again, it was a, just a different time with COVID and not being in person. So I think that kind of played a role into it. 
I'll do some looking into that and get back to you. So thank you. Brian, you had a question? I do. Um, and I know this is something that's been addressed for many years. Um, I'm looking at the rectangular rapid flashing beacons and I've noticed driving through the area that they're very effective with it. Who, who determines where those are placed and like what, who has the final responsibility for that? I'm looking particularly on Monroe at Aldo where there's always been, there's been some concerns over the last several years about um, traffic patterns. And as you drive further into De Pere, you see that they're, they're in De Pere. So the question of whether it's a state highway or not, um, I'm just wondering who has the final decision on that and how does it proceed? Yeah, great question, thank you. Um, so the recommendation can go before the, um, this group and I'll, I can bring that forward and just kind of talk through that. Um, ultimately, it just depends if it's a state highway or what the jurisdiction of some of those pieces are to determine who to talk with. Um, so it'd just be a collaboration between which law enforcement and then if um, whatever board would need to um, get involved as far as that final decision. So I think it, it varies a little bit with each um, infrastructure. So follow up. So th there would be a good chance that it would be with the city being in city limits and with it being a highway that could possibly change it, but with other jurisdictions having it, there, there's a way, but it's the cities. <laughs> yes, um, it, I can't speak for how that would ultimately play out, right? Um, but certainly I will talk with the, um, the planner um, who is in, definitely involved um, in regards to uh, being a real um, large piece of this committee. So I'll talk with her. Okay, any other question, oh, Laura? Um, so it, back when this was being talked about and, and when it was being passed, um, I was part of that process kind of on the tail end of that. And first of all, it's just a wonderful project. It's kind of, um, you know, in the broadest sense, a, a, a partnership with our community, so many people um, are involved in it. Um, one of the things I've always really, really liked about it is that it's designed to um, never be finished. It's like, it's an ongoing project. It's gonna keep getting better and it's gonna keep um, changing. But I like the fact that it's not, not finished ever. Um, the other thing that I really like about it is that anytime the city is going to upgrade its infrastructure, it has to refer to this plan. It has to look at this plan and, and it has to, um, you know, it has to implement things that were decided in this plan. So, you know, it could be, you know, we could be dealing with this plan 20 years, 30 years from now, the guidance that was dis discuss, you know, was um, decided on when this plan was formulated. And, um, that has always struck me as a really interesting way to approach this work, which again, never done, never gonna be finished, um, so it, but always in play. So anyway, I just wanted to comment. Thank you. Yeah, yes, thank you. I, I, I agree that on, ongoing dialogue is, is great. <clears throat> okay, anyone else? Thank you, Chad. Okay, and then next we have our facilities and related services update. And we have Mike Stengel joining us for that. Um, before I start with that, maybe Brian, I can maybe give you a little history on those lights at um, Aldo Leopold. Prior to Chad joining the district, um, we had conversations. Um, we were working with the city traffic department, um, Dave Hansen, the city engineer. Um, we did request them at one time and they refused um, or denied our request. Um, but I think that since that request was put in three, four years ago, um, things have changed quite quite a bit. And now we're seeing them around town. So I think it's a good opportunity to go back and re-request re it. <clears throat> okay. So I'm just here to give you a, a little bit of background on a facilities department. Um, who we are and what we do. Um, 
So anyway, the facilities department um, basically oversees all aspects of um, buildings and grounds. Uh, there's 43 buildings. Now that I'm just counting our major buildings, uh, if we look at all of our outbuildings, like concession stands, restrooms, um, storage buildings, um, there's uh, many more than that. Um, right now, we have over 4,200,000 4, square feet of buildings. When I started with the district in 2005, we we're a little over 3 million square feet of buildings. So in the last you know, 17 years, um, the square foot of buildings increased by you know, 25%. Um, and that has a lot to do with, you know, we've added five buildings since then, uh, buildings like Da Vinci, um, Minoka Hill, um, Cherry Street Building, NEW and JDAW, um, you know, buildings like Baird got drastically increased. Um, and then we have about 377 uh, 37700 acres of land, um, which for a school district our size and that, that amount, um, that is very a small amount. I mean, we, I know school districts that just their high school sites are 100 acres. So um, it shows that we have a lot of buildings, but a lot of very small sites. So um, our responsibilities, we oversee, you know, all aspects of the buildings, grounds and maintenance. Uh, custodial services goes under us. Um, the district security, fire alarms, and card access systems are part of our department, along with the uh, um, heating, ventilating equipment. And then we oversee the energy conservation for the district. Um, we're responsible for any renovations, construction projects that take place with any of the buildings. Um, we oversee the district uh, abatement program now, over the years, you know, most of the asbestos has been removed from the district, but still we have some you know, older floor tile. And in some areas um, we have like pipe coverings that were in walls and stuff that, you know, aren't exposed until we actually do some type of renovation. Um, we maintain the district's fleets, fleet of vehicles. Um, the district has two pools uh, that we maintain. Um, if there's any pest, problems. Um, you know, we, are, we see, you know, with a lot more eating in the classrooms and stuff like that, we have to watch some, you know, for the ants and those types of things that can come along with um, more food in the, in the buildings. Um, the removal of waste and um, recycling, we take care of and the building rentals. So if outside groups or even in um, internal groups uh, want to rent any of our auditoriums or gymnasiums or anything, we oversee that. Um, the facility department has 186 employees um, and how it breaks down is we have 10 building engineers. Those are our day people that maintain our buildings at our secondary schools, high schools, middle schools, Red Smith and district office. Um, 34 are facility technicians. Those are our elementary schools. Um, they're basically a combination between a building engineer because they maintain the building, but they also do custodial work during the day. Um, so they help out with lunch and setting up and cleaning up um, 18 day and midday custodial shifts. People, those again are our secondaries and they work along with our building engineers. And again, they do cleaning throughout the day. Um, they come in early at, and open up the buildings, make sure the sidewalks are shoveled, those types of things. Uh, 12, 12 trades people, carpenters, electricians, plumbers, technicians. Uh, electronics technician, and I'll get into more details on these. Um, utility workers, which is, which is our outside grounds crew. Uh, painter utilities, which are our night painters who support our utility workers. Um, via, two vehicle maintenance and a uh, um, maintenance mechanic, which does fabricating and steel and concrete work for us. So for our custodial services, um, basically the responsibility their main responsibility is for cleaning and sanitizing and making sure that entire buildings are disinfected and clean nightly. Um, they support, you know, the lunch program during the day, breakfast and lunch. And um, they also support any events during the day or in the evenings. So they'll set up, take down. Um, they're, re they're responsible for the removal of any trash and recyclables and safety. So 
um, our people through the days um, are responsible for keeping basically the entrances cleared of, of snow and make sure they're salted so that they're not slippery. Um, our outside crews does the main plowing of the lots and the, the um, drives. Um, they're also responsible for securing the buildings. So our people come in and open the buildings in the morning and then they secure them in the evenings, except for at our middle schools where we have a 24 hour staff. So those buildings are basically opened at six o'clock on Mondays and locked at 6 a.m. on Saturdays. Um, the custodial crew is a 12 month employee. So they work year round. Uh, summer is actually one of our busier times. Um, a lot of staff, you know, at the end of the school year feel, you know, they have a little break, break a breather. And at this time we kind of ramp up some of our services. So um, we support a lot of the programs taking place during the summer, summer school, uh, sports camps, um, and any other um, programs that take place, rentals throughout the summer. Um, it's a time that we do our very deep cleaning uh, and we work around summer school. So we'll clean the schools first that don't have summer school and then we'll shift staff around and go back. But basically it's every room gets completely emptied out. All the furniture, everything gets scrubbed. Um, everything gets put back in the room. Uh, floors are scrubbed and washed and waxed. Um, and then we also do our refinishing of our gym, wood gym floors during the summer. So just to go through um, the next ones are our carpenters. So our carpenters um, do a lot of different projects from small things like going in classrooms and putting up bulletin boards and whiteboards, uh, fixing cabinet doors to actually building cabinets, um, desks, like they've come in here and you know built the, the cabinets tree in here. Uh, we did all the ceiling work and the lighting work in here. So. Um, we do small projects, uh, large construction projects like Baird School and stuff, of course, that get contracted out, but uh, there's a lot of small projects that we can do. Uh, one of our carpenters is a locksmith. Uh, he probably spends 99.9% .9 on locks and doors. Uh, you can imagine we have tens of thousands of doors and locks in this district and just maintaining them all. Uh, since we brought him on board, uh, we're getting a handle on our keys up until then. Keys were requested at buildings, they were made and sent to buildings. Now every key is identified, has, is marked and is checked out to a person. So everyone has a unique number on them. So we're trying to get better at, uh, control on who actually has keys. Um, we have master electricians. Again, they can, being a master electrician, they can pull permits for us. Um, so we can do, you know, projects like relighting this room or um, actually do a, a small construction project and they can do all the electrical that's uh, required. And the same thing with our master plumber. Um, so he can actually do construction. Um, but a lot of times if we have one plumber and you can imagine the amount of sinks and toilets and uh, things we have in the district. Um, and then some of our, you know, uh, project, our buildings are getting aged. So a lot of times we have to completely renovate uh, bathrooms and toilet rooms and take out all the fixtures and redo the plumbing just to keep it updated. Uh, we have several HVAC technicians. Um, the first one is we call him, he's a kind of on the air side. So he works basically with the air handlers and the chillers. And um, he also works with the food service on their coolers and freezers. And that's not only at the ASB, but it's also at all the schools. Uh, then we have a um, one that specializes in the boilers and he maintains and repairs about 93 uh, different boilers that we have at all of our schools. And, uh, most of our schools have multiple boilers. Um, and next slide, Beth. And these boilers have to be tested on an annual basis um, by state state inspectors come in and work with us. And then we have an um, HVAC technician that oversees our controls. Um, this is also an important position. He comes in at 6 a.m. and reviews every single school to make sure that the rooms are at their set points. Um, if there's problems with you know, a, uh, a building being too cold or too hot, 
Um, he'll check and make sure the program is right. You may have to go up to the building and there might be a, a valve stuck or a damper that's not working properly. Um, so all of the, even all these, each um, HVAC technicians kind of have a specialty. They all kind of work as a group and help each other out depending on what kind of projects are going on. Sometimes they're having to get together and replace pumps or fans, uh, motors, those types of things. Um, then we have a maintenance mechanic. And again, he's the fourth person on the team that assists these, but his major focus is on uh, keeping food service equipment running. And he spends a lot of time out there um, on their wrapping machines, um, their kettles, um, other specialty dishwashers. Um, and then he goes around to the different schools helping on those also. Um, and then our electrician, uh, electronics technician, um, basically he works with our security systems, fire alarms, um, access control, sound systems. He works, you know, goes in the auditoriums and adjusts any problems we're having with those type uh, sound systems, the PA systems that were throughout the school. Um, and then he, you know, he also supports technology. So a lot of times if technology needs a data drop brought into a, um, into a classroom or into an office, um, he'll install those also. Next slide. Um, then our utility painters. Um, so these are our utility workers, <clears throat> our day people that work on the outside. Um, so they're responsible for um, grounds maintenance. Um, they mow uh, 8,400,000 square feet of lawns and do snow plowing for a million six hundred thousand square feet of parking lots and a little over eight, uh, 700 square feet of uh, playgrounds. So um, it's a lot of uh, territory to cover. Um, they also maintain our playgrounds. So, if, you know, we have broken swings, those types of things, they'll go out and fix those. Um, they maintain the services. So all the playgrounds, except for the two Head Start pro playgrounds have chipped. So those um, wood chips have to get maintained annually. Um, they support 23 district fields. Those are football fields, soccer fields, baseball, um, softball. Um, but then we use a lot of the city fields. So we have a, um, a joint agreement that we can use some of this, the fields and we help stripe them and maintain them. Um, the city will cut them, but um, we still help, you know, drag the fields, those types of things to get those ready since we're using their fields. So there's 27 of those fields <clears throat> that they also use in the district. So like this spring has been very difficult with all the wet, just trying to get the sports fields, um, baseball fields and the soccer fields in condition this summer or this spring. Um, they're responsible also they, in the winter, a lot of times they'll do trimming and pruning of bushes and maintenance of that during the um, winter and some in the summer. Um, I know in the last couple of years, we've had to remove over 50 um, ash trees from the district that have been affected with emerald ash. So that's been a, a big job. Um, we have, they maintain the irrigation systems on our fields. And, um, and then besides that, they fill in for our facility tech. So um, this year has been challenging, you know, with a lot of people out COVID, um, we've been a couple of staff. So when, um, we need people to go into buildings. They're all trained to fill in. Uh, we do our own internal subbing for all of our custodial and all of our, we don't um, have any other subbing except for internal people. <clears throat> Next slide. Um, then we have two vehicle mechanics. Um, they're responsible for maintaining all of our equipment that's used inside and outside. So some of the equipment inside are our lifts that we use, um, floor scrubbers, all that. But then we have um, 80 trucks and heavy equipment that we use for snow, um, snow plowing. Um, we have work trucks, vans that you see that they drive around, um, student transportation, vans, and there's in the food service delivery trucks. And then we have other equipment like <clears throat> tractors and skid steers and lawnmowers that um, we use for just maintaining cutting grass and snow plowing and maintaining the, the property. Plus then they do 
um, all the small equipment also like snow blowers. Each building has walk behind snow blower, leaf blowers, chainsaws. So um, there's always a, the shop is always full of equipment being taken care of. Along with they go out to the buildings and maintain the emergency generators at all the schools that have emergency generators along with um, ASB and district office. So just that's basically our, our staff. And the next slide are the projects that we've, some of the projects we complete it now, we complete you know three, four times this amount, but a lot of them are small projects where we'll go in and replace a door that's broken or some cabinets, fix some cabinets or in a classroom, we might um, have to replace some windows that are broken. So there's a lot of projects that are taken, but just some of the bigger projects to highlight. On an annual basis, we try to put money away to keep maintaining. So we do a district-wide flooring and um, repair and replacement every year. So we try to chip off and do the worst floorings um, that we, we know of. Same thing with um, site repairs. So site repairs includes not only damage of you know, sod and grass, but um, there might be just sections of asphalt that need to be cut out and replaced. And we can do that without replacing the entire parking lot. Um, we use a lot of this also for seal coating and restriping. Um, and then district wide mas masonry and duct pointing is just an ongoing thing that we're always um, making sure because um, we're trying to keep the buildings watertight. Um, our worst enemy is you know leaking roofs and windows and and masonry. Uh, this year replaced the the roof on King Elementary. Uh, we replaced the parking lots at East High School, um, Auxiliary Services Building, Franklin Middle School, Lombardi Middle School, and Lincoln Elementary. Uh, we did a re window replacement at Howe Elementary. Um, we did a culinary arts lab at East High School. If you've gone over there, I think that turned out very well, turning. Um, we did a complete LED replacement um, at Preble High School, East High School, and Southwest High School. Those are very large projects. Um, library renovations at our high schools, Preble East, West, Southwest, and Red Smith. Um, and flooring replacement in the offices at Preble, uh, office and student services at West, and in the commons at Howe. And then we just are completing up the locker inst installation at Webster. Now these projects are all done out of our operating Fund 10 project. None of this is referendum money. This is our annual um, operating money. So, just give you a look at what we're looking at for next year. On the next slide is our 2022 2023 projects. And again, these are the major projects. I didn't put every small project on. But again, we're looking at district wide flooring, um, site repairs, and asphalt maintenance and uh, masonry, which we do every year. Um, this year, we're going to be doing some repair work on the McAuliffe and Red Smith roofs and a roof replacement on Franklin. Uh, we're going to be replacing the parking lots at uh, NEW Jadal on the Cherry Street site, uh, Edison, Eisenhower, Southwest, and Da Vinci par um, will be doing um, parking lot replacements. Uh, at West High School, that's uh, a joint. Um, tennis court. So we're splitting the cost with the city to resurface that uh, tennis court. Um, that's part of our joint uh, use agreement with the city. Uh, we have some door replacements, uh, entrance door replacements at Franklin and Washington. Uh, we're going to replace all the flooring in the two commons at Franklin and Washington. Um, here at the district office, we have to replace the air handler in our auto shop. And then we're looking at starting some renovation on the Welcome Center, trying to put some windows in there and trying to lighten it up and get it a little bit more modern and more welcoming. So that's pretty much what I have to present on who we are and kind of what we do. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer those. Brian. Um, Mike, I have two, well, one statement and then a question with it. Um, I spent a lot of time in Green Bay schools and I've spent a lot of time in other schools and the facilities department, these buildings are top notch as far as cleanliness and everything on a consistent basis. Your staff is doing a fantastic job. So thank you. 
for doing that. Um, my follow-up question with this is when looking, you had said that staff was able to sub internally for different positions at times, uh, especially during COVID. I know previously there's been either a formal or an informal practice of um, kind of training within so our employees can move up into positions if they open up, um, particularly in the facilities department. Is there a formal program with that or is that something that can be addressed with it so we aren't losing our employees if we don't need to and that we're not necessarily bringing in people from outside the district that haven't worked for us to understand the Green Bay way? We have an informal process. Um, we always looked to fill it internally first. That's our, our goal. Um, what we do is we have our, we have the opportunity, especially in summer with any staff that really wants to learn more about, you know, like if they're a custodian, they wanna work into a facility uh, technician job. Um, if they come to us and show interest, we can, a lot of times, especially during the summer, we'll team them up with a, another facility tech and then that facility tech will work with them and show them, you know, how to take the boiler apart and how to change out some of the um, filters in the unit vents, uh, in the um, VAV boxes. And, you know, they'll work with them. Um, so we've, I would say that <clears throat> the majority are, of our positions, well over 50%, when it's a, an up, uh, step up position are filled internally. Okay. James? Uh, yes, yeah, so I just see a 2021-22 uh, project for LED light replacement at the three high schools. Can you um, describe, is this part of a larger initiative to replace all bulbs with LEDs and where are we in that initiative? because I don't see anything scheduled for next year to continue. Yes, um, that is a long-term goal is to switch over to um, LED. Uh, what we tried to handle are some of our biggest bang for the bucks, some of our big high schools. Um, it just so happened that last year we had the available resources to do it. And so we're, Normally we wouldn't do three big schools in one year, but it just so happened that we had the resources. Uh, we had other projects that came in under budget. Um, so we we're you know, given the opportunity to um, get a more done than we normally would. But um, you know, our next one that we'd be looking at doing uh, would be uh, West High School. And the only reason that it's not on this year's is that we felt that we probably needed to really concentrate a little bit on the welcoming center this year um, because we just felt that that was a little bit bigger need because of the condition, you know, the building is pretty dark and not as welcoming as we would like it to be. Laura? Um, just some observations and some thoughts. You, you mentioned that we had increased our, our square footage by about 25%, I think, over the last um, few years. Now, some of that, some of that was uh, referendum work. Um, I know we added a lot of community space that benefits the whole entire um, community, which I'm, I, I know that's been really beneficial. Um, do you, and then some of the um, gymnasiums that were used also as lunchrooms, which is really hard. Do, uh, do we have any schools anymore that still use their gyms as lunchrooms? And how, like, how many? Okay, I can't. I'm remember. sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, um, I can't remember exactly how many we have. But we do still have some. Um, the one that comes to mind right now is, is Chapel, um, Kennedy, um, MacArthur. Uh, so I can, you know, I would have to kind of go through school by school. Um, but there's still, I'm thinking there's six to eight of them, approximately. I know the last referendum addressed some of that in yes. some of our schools, and it's a, it's a lot to build a whole new gym. You know, it's a, it's a lot of money, but. Um, uh, 
And then uh, the other thing that stood out was 186 employees. Um, I, I look at that number and I think well, that just sort of illustrates the scope of the work that you do and how huge our district is. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that seems, a lot of that work often seems invisible. Like it just happens by magic, even though we all know it doesn't. Um, but I, I uh, you know, it's just a monumental job that, that you and your people do. Um, I always think about, when I think about our district and the buildings, just the maintenance of it, I always think of that as, a, as an investment that our taxpayers have made for generations in our, in our district and that proper maintenance respects that investment. Um, and I agree with Brian, um, our buildings are just a pleasure to walk into um, and I, I always, I often notice how well maintained they are and how um, beautiful they are often. Um, so I just wanna say thank you and kudos to you and your, and your, and your crew. It's, it's really interesting to see the full scope that you showed of what they do and what's required to keep our buildings in, in tip top shape. So thank you. Yeah, I mean, we have some, you know, we have very excellent crew. Um, you know, it, it's amazing, even to myself, even working alongside them that, you know, we'll get a snow, flop, snow um, storm or, and, you know, four or five inches of snow and, um, you know, they'll be out all night and they'll have the entire district of 40 sites cleared and ready to go by 6 a.m. Um, they have it down pretty pat and, um, you know, the one thing during COVID, the I guess if you want to look at the bright side of it, um, it gave us some chance to really go through and do a lot of um, internal work. Um, one thing that we did is we went through and repolished and stripped and repolished and resealed into all the trails on the district. And um, that's something that we just put our crews at and worked on that for a few months. And, um, you know, you look, you even just walk in the district office and you look at our trazzle here. I mean, it's over a hundred years old and it still looks pretty good. I mean, there's some cracks and stuff, but for a hundred year old flooring, it's in pretty good shape. Well, I agree with you very much. So thank you so much. Okay. Just a new board member question real quick. All of your budget, does it go through account 327 in the budget under um, construction contractors? Most. Most, okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, I'm not sure if all of you are aware, but Mr. Stengel has submitted his retirement and as of July 1, will no longer be an employee with the district. And I did wanna take a second to acknowledge he uh, holds so much information in that head about every single piece of property that we own and uh, it's gonna be a great loss for us. But what you acknowledged, Brian, it's in large part because of Mike's dedication to the district. So thanks, Mike. <laughs> okay, next up we have student fees. And Angie, that's. Thanks. So um, this is the recommendation to bring forward um, to reinstate charging student fees for the 22-23 school year. So just a little bit of a history um, or a little background, we stopped and we did not charge general fees for students for the last two years um, due to the pandemic. So the recommendation um, that I'm bringing forward is to reinstate those fees. None of the fees have changed. Um, all, of the, all of the rates uh, remain the same. And this brings in about $500,000 uh, into the general fund on an annual basis. If, um, if a student receives free and reduced lunch, those fees are waived? That is correct. They have to fill out um, a proper form in order to waive those fees. But then yes, then we can waive those fees for those students. Any questions? Andrew? Uh, thank you. So some of them are, but some of them are marked un unwaivable. That's, oh, sorry. 
and I think there's different different levels of uh, I would I would argue that transcript fees are are pretty essential even though five are free for everyone I um, seems to me that's the one that I think most might warrant consideration of just um, being a waivable fee um, I I recognize that other things like um, activity tickets and passes are more of a more of a gray area. Um, the the parking permit fee being unwaivable, I guess, con concerns me to some to some extent as well. Um, I've brought this up um, every year. I'm I'm glad that over the years we've moved more into the general the single general. Uh, waivable general fee, but I guess I'm interested in seeing if there's, um, I won't take up a lot of time if I'm the only board member interested in it, but I would like to, I think between now and um, now in the board meeting, it's worth at least some discussion about transcript fee and parking fee being waivable for free and reduced. Brian. I'm going to assume that this is all put into the general fund because it would be a, an accounting nightmare to figure out the $75 going into the fund for maintenance of the parking lot, for example, or any activities funds going for, you know, gate admission, going to pay for coaching riders and everything else like that. So thank you. Nancy, you good? Okay. Any other questions or comments? Laura? Just kind of building off um, what Andrew was talking about, the student activity pass, why would that not be waivable based on free and reduced lunch? And what does that actually all entail? I am not 100% not sure as to why it wasn't included in the waivable fees. Um, I can look into that. Um, the activity pass, I do believe in, um, I don't, I, I don't know if you know, Vicki, what that all entails, um, but I could check with Tim Flood as well, if you want details. My, my thought is just that we know how important any sort of extracurricular or any activity outside of the class can be really helpful for student engagement. And we wouldn't want, I wouldn't want cost to be preventative for students to be involved in those activities. But I, again, I'm not certain what that would include. So just for consideration, thank you. <laughs> Andrew? Um, that is a, a pass to attend though. It's not a participation. Uh, participation is covered under the general fees. Now I still think it's good for, you know, I, I, I would also be interested in exploring some kind of a, you know, possibly could we look at a waivable activity pass for, you know, two per, you know, one or two per student who's doing one of the activities that would be charged for. Um, I think it's important to have, I mean, the, the most important thing is that we got rid of the uh, pay to participate activity fee many years ago, uh, which is th the most important, but I, I think looking at making a fee waivable for um, the activity passes for, for families is quite possibly worth a look as well, so. Um, I, I will probably intend to propose an amendment to at least make transcript fees fully waivable at the next meeting and, and possibly some of the others. I am glad that it doesn't represent any increases over um, before we suspended fees. I, I'll verify this before the, the May 23rd meeting, but I, I believe we still have the practice of the starfish fund I don't know if that sounds familiar to you, Angie or Claudia. Okay, we, we do. So students in need um, can access the fund through their uh, school social worker. So I'll, I just verified it. So we still have that. Okay, anything else? Awesome. We are gonna go on to rental fees. Vicki, do you know, is that, Mike, is that you? You're, you're back again? 
we, we just gave you this grand farewell and now you're back already. <laughs> it's only been five minutes, Mike. Can't stay away. Um, basically the rental fees uh, were recommending just holding them um, the same as they have been. And we're not looking at any increases. Um, basically we didn't rent out our buildings all through COVID. Um, even now it's very minimum. So we feel that we should just keep the fees as they were from last year. How much money do we bring in with facility rentals? Do you know? I'm, I would have to get back to you on that one. I don't know the total amount. If there's a student organization in a building, so say, um, well, like I just said, a student organization in a building that was holding an event and it's sponsored by that organization, are the rental fees waived then? Yes. Yeah, it's, we don't rent. I mean, if there's, it's not, um, you know, even if the, like the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, I mean, those are waivable fees. It's, it's more or less if somebody's holding a camp and they're charging students or um, an outside uh, the symphony wants to use uh, one of our auditoriums or a dance group wants to use, uh, those are more the rentals, but yeah, we don't charge our internal um, organizations any rentals. Okay, we're all good. All righty, that concludes the operations portion of our meeting. I think we are going on to education. Next. Education, the education section will be um, facilitated by Andrew Becker. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll open with the Head Start Supplemental Application Summary. Okay, thank you, Andrew. And we do have Sally uh, joining us virtually. And I think Andre is there as well. Hi, everybody. This is Sally <clears throat> joining virtually. Um, we were, uh, we received a letter on April 20th from the Office of Head Start um, that we were eligible to receive a cost of living adjustment of $95,192. That supports a 2.28% increase above fiscal year 2021 funding levels to increase staff salaries and fringe benefits. Those funds would be effective July 1st, 2022 for the next school year. In addition, this year, the Office of Head Start included quality improvement funds to be used for one-time activities in the fiscal year 22 budget period. The Head Start program would use that allocated amount of $16,706,000 for staff wages to offset the higher increase of 4.7% that was approved by the school board for the 22-23 school year. So um, the amount that was received, um, well not received, but applied for April 1st, uh, approved by the board on March, in the March board meeting was $4,175,084 in program operations, $35,690 for training and technical assistance. Those two amounts combined with the new funding amount um, of the COLA increase in quality improvement would bring our total Head Start budget amount for the 22-23 program year to four million three hundred and twenty-two dollars and six hundred and seventy-two dollars. I don't even know if I said that right. The figure's so big, um, but anyway. Um, so we're just seeking approval from the school board that we can submit the grant to the Office of Head Start, which is due on June first, um, twenty twenty-two. All right, any uh, questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, that'll move forward to the board meeting. I, I don't want this to become a habit tonight, but I did want to acknowledge that Sally has, did she leave? No, no she's there. No. <laughs> Sally, <laughs> Sally has also submitted her resignation and uh, the reason our Head Start programs are as big and uh, supported in this community is because of Sally's leadership over the years. So she will be greatly missed. And I uh, just wanted to make sure we acknowledged your work, Sally. Thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> 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 oh. 
Okay, uh, thank you. Next, we have technology platforms used for learning and a recommendation uh, memo. Good evening. Well, I'm back and I brought some friends with me this time to answer your excellent questions. Um, those that work closest to the work are, are the better place to answer the questions that the really awesome question you actually had the last time I was here. Um, uh, really our spearhead of this project has been the oversight of this project is uh, director um, Stephen Miller. And so um, all of those wonderful technical questions you were asking me and I was so forthcoming and saying that's not my forte. Um, I lean heavy on Stephen to bring that piece of knowledge to our team. So Stephen, do you wanna take it from here and any questions you might have? <laughs> no, I guess he doesn't. <laughs> any questions you might have um, since the last time we met? Uh, new, new questions from the board? Nancy? Well, I don't know if it's exactly a question, but it's just how I'm feeling about this. And I just, I wonder if there's really money for this because, you know, like we're going to be going into this assessment thing and this is kind of an assessment tool. And are we gonna find out that maybe we won't need this? Do we know for sure, sure that, um, like, is it going to go into the regular ed kids too, or is it just going to be interventionists? Do we know all of these things? And I'm just feeling that, you know, at this time, like there's just only so many dollars, amount of dollars to go around. And I think that $1.2 million is just a lot to me. And um, speaking to some of the um, interventionists that have used it, they, they do say, you know, it looks like it could be something really good, but then they had some other things about like, um, like the narrative box, they didn't like that so much and how you can accept, access the, the, um, the program, you know, like it shuts down in 20 minutes versus the way they had it with the other program. And also um, they miss the drop downs of for the testing, all the different testing data. And, I, and so I'm just, just a little weary about this. So I can speak to some of that. We asked the interventionists to test it so that they could give us some of that exact feedback. And we've brought them back numerous times. And I have not heard that from any of them. Maybe you have, Stephen. Um, but we would be able to work with the company to see what we can do to try to remedy those situations. Oh. Stephen, do you have other things? Yep. Can you hear me okay, Nancy? I can, thank you. All right. I'm going to try to tackle all three, but it was three in a row. I can <laughs> usually remember two pretty good, but uh, I will do my best to get all three. So okay, thank um, you. I'll handle, I think, the easiest one first, and that's the shuts off after 20 minutes thing. So a, a lot of our programs, and most people don't realize this, but a lot of different programs that vendors provide to us have like that inactivity shutdown. And that's actually a good security feature to have. I mean, right. if we feel like 20 minutes is not long enough, we could certainly reach out to the company and work with them to try to see if we can extend that window. But I, in, in my experience, I can okay. say that 20 minutes is pretty standard across most platforms that have secure student information in them. Um, somebody might know differently, but 20 minutes is pretty common. I'm trying to think, you know, off the top of my head, like when my credit union times out, but I know like if I leave that, you know, inactive long enough that it'll time out. And, uh, you know, like the secure testing sites for state testing, that will time out. I, I want to say it's 20 minutes of inactivity. Yeah. So that's pretty standard. So that was one. And then mm -hmm. another one was uh, the way in which the interventionists can enter their information. So I'm excited to hear that they're all seeing promise in the program. And what I have seen, you know, just from a feedback standpoint, 
is that this has galvanized a lot of our staff members to the point where they're pushing and they're saying, we could be doing so much more with this program. And I, what about this? And what about this? And quite honestly, I haven't seen this much excitement Good. that has galvanized so many different kinds of staff members um, in, in a while. And, you know, like I get a little excited when they get excited, <laughs> you know, it's nice. It's nice when we can have that back and forth. So um, they, they try to, what Panorama did when they built their program, they tried to build a program with the student in mind first. And a lot of times when you work with different vendors who provide dashboard type products, um, it's more about putting the student into a bar graph and you know, being able to like bring all that data together and then less about what does it look like on that individual student level. And what I've seen with Panorama is they're more about writing that narrative about how that student is doing rather than just plugging in scores because that doesn't always represent a complete picture of the child. And so while the narrative is in some ways limiting, um, one of the things that we're gonna be working with them on is other ways to bring some of those other data points that we currently have in Infinite Campus into the system so that when teachers go in, they'll have everything right there. Thank you, Steve. All right, perfect. Two I'm usually pretty good at, you're gonna to have to help me with the third one. Oh, okay. the drop downs. Oh, sure. And so I'm guessing they're comparing that to TSAR. And, you know, so a little bit uh, of history and context that I can provide because I've been along for this ride. Um, when we first started tracking intervention in Green Bay, we did really try to use Infinite Campus because you should always use the tools you have. We have access to Infinite Campus. It's part of the package that we get. Unfortunately, Infinite Campus was a very limiting tool and a very labor intensive tool. We heard loud and clear from our staff that had to put information in Infinite Campus. It was taking four, five, six clicks just to do an update. So we said, well, what can we do with the resources we have? We worked with our programming team. We took a program. Some of you know about it, some of you don't. You'll hear about it before long, I'm sure, because it seems like it, it's always kind of out there. But uh, TSAR, which we had created, it was a homegrown product designed by our programming team. Um, that allowed us to capture information similar to how you might enter information on a spreadsheet. But what it did is it brought that information right back into Infinite Campus. So instead of four or five or six clicks to do an update on each student, teachers could go in and two to three clicks, they could have a whole list of the kids that they had intervention on and do those updates. And we created the drop downs. Um, we added comments so that they could capture robust information with not as much work and not as much time. Because frankly, the more time you spend entering data, the less time you have to work with kids. The only reason we're here talking to you today is, and I've seen it, like Panorama is gonna be better than what we've cobbled together with Infinite Campus and with TSAR, even though we're meeting the letter of the law with those. Panorama gives us the ability to bring all of that information together in one system and make that entry and, and that monitoring process easy for the interventionists, easy for the teachers who have those kids in class to see what interventions they're in, and easy for those building administrators to monitor and track how their kids are doing in intervention. And that's the only reason why we're here today. And $1.2 million is a lot of money, but we wouldn't be bringing it forward to you if we didn't believe that it had the possibility to positively impact the students in our schools and would be better for the students and the staff that are engaged in intervention. Thank you, Stephen. Before we um, move off of that, I, I would, I apologize. I'd like to introduce two very valuable team members that work in the teaching and learning department. Uh, Ms. Tammy Jones, she's the associate director of um, literacy intervention, oversees our literacy intervention. And I know that she has some guests. If we could have our guest out in Cyberland there, uh, interventionist, if you'll please turn on your camera so we can see you. There's Brittany. Thank you, Brittany. <laughs> and I know uh, Ms. Jones has some uh, testimonials. And then also um, we have uh, Ms. Emily Thomas, and uh, she is our 
math teacher leader and oversees our math intervention um, in, our, in our district. And so um, there are a wealth of knowledge as well as the interventionists that have joined us. So if you have any additional questions, again, people closest to the work really can speak to the work uh, more clearly. Brian. Um, thank you. I kind of asked this question last time you were here and I just wanted if you could clarify a bit with me. As far as the information being able to be transferred within district to other teachers. So if you have a fifth grader that's going to school at King and then goes to Webster, how deep of records go within district? And then to follow up, how deep of records go outside of district that you can share with other districts? Because we have such a turnover sometimes of students within the district going to other ones that, you know, looking particularly into interventions and how, you know, if a student moves in April, does it reset the clock in, in the communication there? And I guess, is that something that you're working on as far as within the CESA or within neighboring districts as well? Or are we kind of leading by being the large district in the area and going that approach? I guess I'm the lucky one that gets to do most of the talking tonight. So uh, I'll talk about within district and, and I'm glad you brought that up, Brian, because that's been um, a concern of mine for a long time in Green Bay. And part of the reason why we actually pushed for TSAR um, in the beginning is like, we would have teachers tracking information about kids in their class and we have eight to 9% interdistrict transfer. Now that went down during the pandemic we didn't have as much movement and I don't know what post pandemic is going to look like but again at one point in time we were looking at eight to nine percent mobility rate in our district um, and so we needed that assessment information to follow the child in a way better than trying to photocopy a page out of somebody's notebook and send it over and that's why we really pushed hard to get all that information into infinite campus so that it could follow the student so on an in-district transfer easy I mean all the infinite campus stuff goes in Panorama, that student's going to move from one school to the other, so you're going to see what intervention they were in. I mean, that's all very simple. Uh, from district to district, the practice has been and probably will be for a while, and this has a lot to do with student records and um, trying to figure out the best way to move things from one place to another. There is some information at the state level, such as that state student ID, state testing information, when that student moves from district to district, the new district has access to all of that information. There's a lot of information that still gets sent the old fashioned way, which is via like a secure scan from uh, Infinite Campus where we just basically do a data dump on that kit and we send it over when we get a records request. Not as familiar with that aspect, but I know a little bit about it. So that will continue to be the case. And in that case, what we would have to do is we would have to do a PDF of that student's intervention plan from Panorama and send it over as part of that records request. Now, the dream would have been to have one statewide student information system. Then all this information could have gone back and forth, but that didn't happen for various reasons um, because a lot of districts wanted to maintain their autonomy with the ability to select their own student information system. And so we have the system we have now, which is really, um, like an advanced fax system, basically. Don? Okay, so this is a five-year contract um, and we're using ESSER dollars for this. So this is not money that's coming from our operational budget. Correct. Yeah, it, that it is. Well, the reason I say that is because we had to use 20% of our um, dollars for educational and remediation um, programs. And so instead of new projects and new money, we're, we're actually using ESSER money to replace what would have been teaching and learning money. So we're swapping funds to meet the quota of the 20% under the ESSA, ESSER um, law um, for ESSER three. So if we weren't doing this with ESSER funds, this is money that would have come out of the operational budget. So this is, and, and I mean, the operational budget is where salaries come from. 
So this is actually freeing up operational dollars by bundling into a five-year contract and using those ESSER funds. I would like to hear from the interventionists who have been um, piloting the tool, just what their thoughts are, what kinds of efficiencies they're seeing with the tool. I can go ahead and share. Um, I'm Brittany Baranek. I am the math interventionist at Nicolay Elementary. I've been using Panorama for the last about two months and I've been using it with all eight of my interventions. Um, things that I really like about Panorama, I like how the students are grouped together. That's something we've never been able to do with TSAR when I have a group of students versus individual interventions. Um, and it groups them and it shows me the goal for the whole group for the intervention, which is really nice to see. Every time I go in, the goal is right at the top there, um, which we didn't have before. There's an opportunity to input weekly data. The progress monitoring for my tier three students is already put into a graph when I log in. So that's been really nice to see. Otherwise, normally the um, school site would just hold on to that information and we couldn't see it really till the end of the intervention. Um, I get to upload the in anecdotal weekly notes just like I did with TSAR, um, but it's really nice to have it all in the same place. So I don't have data in one place and then my notes somewhere else and then my goal in the third place. Um, that's kind of been the biggest benefit in my opinion is that everything is in one spot. And then when I do a summary at the end of an intervention, that's there as well. So when an intervention is over, I can go back and see everything all at once. Um, each weekly data point, all of my notes, the goal, whether they met the goal or not, the graph. Um, it's really been a time saver in my opinion and also better for me instructionally with that goal constantly being there at the top and then um, the weekly data points that I'm able to input now. So I have really enjoyed using Panorama over TSAR for all of my interventions for the past couple months. The, this is a flat rate. This is not based off licensing, correct? The rate doesn't change based off of the number of people. No, that does not. It's flat rate. It's locked in at what we have. And I included in the update, the amount that we'd be saving every year. And in order to use ESSER three funds, we had to show a saving over multiple years of using the contract, or it wouldn't have been eligible for the ESSER um, three funds. So the plan is to have all the interventionists using the tool by the start of the 22-23 school year. But no, that's okay. Will this go to, I think Nancy had asked this, is this something that classroom teachers will be using at some point? Yes, they will be using it. Um, we started with intervention. It's an intervention tool um, at the school level. In fact, um, I'd really like the people closest to work, but I'm, I'm going to fill it in. And then Tammy and Emily, I'd like for you to speak to this. Um, so at each of our schools, we have a learning support teams and those learning support teams discuss students that are being referred for intervention. Then the... Um, building principals and the directors will all be trained as they facilitate those meetings. And then of course we have our classroom teachers who make the referral for the students for additional resources and additional help. And so having our interventionists trained to this level when they, they can either join and learn from our interventionists as part of that process for learning support teams or there will be additional support for them, uh, teachers to learn through and using the resource um, with our tech integrators who also will be preparing support, face-to-face -face support, as well as how to do um, videos that they can watch. Emily or Tammy, would you like to speak to more of that? It's a collaborative effort based on the teacher and the interventionist. They will come together and they talk about the students that they have concern with, either in literacy or in math. So when the teacher creates a plan and she brings forth her concerns, the intervention is in the meeting, the LST meeting with that teacher. So they create a plan from the needs for the universal. Then the lit literacy interventions or math interventions will create a plan for intervention. So it's both in one document so that they're collaborating together 
And anybody that wants to look at the plans that was created for that particular student, they can see that. Yeah, I would, I would just add to what Tammy was saying, it's gonna give us a nice view of a student's path over time. And so in our, in our multi-level systems of support, we wanna see students getting that support over time. We have record of it, like she said, all in one spot. It's kind of like a timeline. So now we can just see quickly the summary of all the support that students have had, what's been successful, what hasn't been, and what, what areas have we focused on and targeted over time. And I also have um, testimonials from the interventionists because I work directly with them on a day-to-day -day basis. And so some of them could not be here tonight, but they did send in their emails with their, what they like about it. So if I can just read just one, um, one says this, as I begin to use Panorama, I'm finding many benefits. Having everything on one platform is very beneficial. It is simple to create an intervention plan and enter data. I like that it generates a graph of students' progress and sends out email reminders to update progress when needed. Thank you. I just I just wanted to add that there's, if you were to see the dashboard, it's it's got the academics on there, math and literacy. It also will have the attendance on there and it will have, if there's any um, social emotional um, interventions that are going on, starting with universal. Um, and then there's also mental health on there. So it's all, one area so you can truly what they were saying look at the entire child with one click and not oh here i got this in the plp which is a personal learning plan oh i've got this in the counselor notes oh i've got this in the in tsar it will all be right there so that you can look at the entire child and discuss the entire child and not have to have multiple meetings with multiple staff members uh, james Thank you. Um, I asked a couple of questions last meeting, and I just want to follow up. Um, you're here because the way the contracts were restructured to be paid up front crosses a threshold of $250,000 for us to approve that. But attached to that threshold is a transition from a process of select package selection where you have a lot of latitude to define that process and a formal RFP process. And I was told, I think, that these were renewals, therefore we didn't have to go to RFP. So I don't exactly know what the threshold does for the public. And I don't know when I look at this because I trust all of your competence in package selection. I don't, I don't argue that this is the package or not to go with. Haven't spent enough time, spent a lot of career time doing it but I don't know what the opportunity cost is. I don't know what other opportunities to spend ESSER 20% funds were evaluated and how we landed on spending this money here. Is there any background that can be provided? A absolutely, Stephen, um, it's been about a half a year, the years are mixing. All of the other resources that we reviewed before the team selected uh, Panorama in the difference between those other resources, such as the cell survey, so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I think, but it, and correct me if I'm wrong, James, but I think your questioner is around not just looking at other intervention systems, but any kind of like thing we could do with that 20%, and we're doing this instead. So I'm actually going to refer that back because it, it's, it's a broader than just looking at the different platforms. It's like, of all the things we could have done, we're doing this. Why is this the thing? So thank you. I, I'm sorry. I thought you were asking the comparison be, between the different platforms we reviewed before selecting this. Um, but noting that we looked at, uh, I met with uh, Angie and her team, and they provided us guidance in looking at the, um, actually the platforms are the large ticket items that we have in the teaching and learning budget that would be eligible for this grant under these parameters and guidelines. And um, that was one piece that we wanted to make sure that we did is that we would take the, the resources that we know we are going to be using over the next five, three to five years. And we looked at other resources and then the greatest amount that we could um, put into ESSER and have it be eligible that would really replace what we were spending the district money on. And so to be totally upfront, um, 
if we did go with the higher cost items uh, for this and knowing that we are going to be placing that and using that in the district anyway, it was a bigger savings for the district to put our larger cost items. And it was, it's very explicitly clear when they outline um, in ESSER 3 in the use for the 20% what those dollars needed to be used for. So you're kind of boxed into what are we already doing? You know, what are we, what are we already have in place in the district, the vision of moving forward in the district? What can we use that meets this eligibility, but then still allows the district to save money beyond the years of the ESSER grant? Is that what you're asking? So there are a lot of constraints on the on the spend, and this is a safe, well-known problem that you're attacking. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. All right, other other questions? I guess I, I would like to ask as as we look at expanding this, and I, I understand the um, where it does make sense to have mostly interventionists be trying this first. I guess my, my concern is I want to be really sure that we have strong evidence that this is going to translate well to, um, to teachers in the general classroom, uh, because this is a very big ticket item to, if we were to start hearing complaints about it immediately next year and, you know, be told, why didn't you, you know, I, I understand why we tested, why we had um, interventionists volunteer to do most of the uh, testing, but can we get some reassurance that there's been, you know, communication with classroom teachers and that classroom teachers are ready for this too? So we, I would say that's probably in our next phase of looking at how we'll use Panorama. Right now we've been focused on what it's going to look like for our interventionists and our intervention plans. We have started talking preliminarily, prelim, preliminarily in our meetings about what that is going to look like for those plans that Tammy was talking about. So um, just in which part of the platform we're going to put that in and um, where does it make the most sense for teachers to be putting it in and where does it make the most sense for people, all, you know, all those stakeholders that we're talking about that are part of this process to go and find that information. And so we're talking about that at this point. But when we talked about um, the 22-23 school year being our full rollout and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's for our interventionists to be rolling out their plans in Panorama. Um, and so I would, I would think in the future is when we would start to look at, um, you know, having teachers pilot in the same way um, and giving some feedback in that way as well. So is this, am I, um, isn't this being this big of a ticket item, isn't this replacing certain things that we're trying to move away from, like towards a, a phase replacement, but a complete replacement of, of some things that are being done elsewhere, correct? You're correct. We are no longer um, using the platform EduClimber. Um, and we have moved all of that that we used to use EduClimber for. It was minimally used. And what we did use it for um, will be included as part of our panorama low, uh, rollout. Okay, so where was this, if EduClimber was minimally used, then what was happening to the data that would have been put in EduClimber, but EduClimber wasn't being used and panorama wasn't here yet? So that all of that data gets pushed from IC and Stephen, feel free to jump in here. So that the all of the data that we had in EduClimber we own that data in our infinite campus system. So we have that data. I believe that's what you're asking. And so all of that data is being pushed into Panorama and is in Panorama right now. Um, go ahead and it's hard to explain because where the teachers come in is when we, when we start building personalized learning plans, the teacher makes the referral is where the teacher comes into the process. And it's so, it's an implementation. It's kind of like um, a best looked at as um, learning by doing. 
So instead of having everyone come down and we give them and there are it's an hour training instead of having everyone come down to district office and have an hour overview on how to use panorama. Um, it's actual connection to their work that they're doing like as part of their job and by doing their work they're learning how to use the system and it's not a very complex system so the rollout will be very meaningful to the classroom teacher who's in the same meeting with the principal who's in the same meeting with the interventionist so it's a it's a piece of the work that you're doing not something being done to you um, I, I see them I anticipate teachers taking off with this and wanting more and more. I know the principals already do. We're awarding them, we're kind of holding them off until we can get the interventionists really solid in this so that we have multiple um, places of support within the schools. And so we're building capacity as well as using the tool by doing it. I just also want to add, you asked where has this data been stored? It's been stored in multiple places and that's what's been difficult because some of it is in the counselor tab, some of it's in the PLP, some of it you have to go through, um, if it's a behavioral referral, you're looking through all the incident referrals to see um, suspensions and um, patterns of behaviors. Um, teachers had them in notebooks. They had them, I mean, they had them everywhere, which is why we want them in one spot. So it's easy and everybody knows where to look. Um, and I know some people were better at using the PLPs than the others. So it, it became very um, inefficient, I guess you would say. And I think this is what that's going to do. Um, and we do have a role, we're gonna be next rolling it out to <coughs> um, the directors of schools because they're the closest to, to the work in the schools. Um, and Tammy and her team will, will be doing it when they're doing their LST meetings. Teachers have to know where this data is, right? And principals will have the opportunity to have the dashboard show up on their, on their computer every morning when they turn on their computer. So we have to get them knowledge at least about the, pro the product and what they're looking at. And so that will happen this year. But we want it to be rolled out meaningfully. Um, we did some training when we said it was supposed to be for interventionists. And there were individuals on that training that were not in doing interventions with any children, right? So they're telling us how it didn't, you know, I would have preferred it to be in, in person and it wasn't geared for them. It was geared for the interventionists. So we need, then we need to make sure we're gearing all of the professional learning to the targeted audience. So what the principals need to know is not what the interventionists need to know, which is not what the teachers need to know. So we're being very purposeful in how we roll that out and um, manageable so that um, it's rolled out in a fashion that is, that the teachers do see the value of it. I, I guess I'm still, um, I don't, I guess I, I, I don't think I have any more specific question here, but I guess what, what I still don't entirely have my head wrapped around here is it sounds like I'm, it sounds like this is a m massive game changing big ticket replacement for multiple existing systems to streamline it into one right and at the same time but it's just inter it's just interventionists who are doing it right now and then it sounds like maybe teachers who are um in the, in the parts of what they do that's working closely with interventionists that are like will it what will be gone in, if this is a big success? What won't exist in three years that's here today? I see a, a part of I see, like what does it replace? Yeah, so eventually we would look to phase out our use of the infinite campus PLP and RTI tabs. We would look to phase out our use of TSAR to capture intervention information. At this time, there are no plans for TSAR to go away completely. Again, TSAR was built to be uh, an assessment capturing tool, not necessarily an intervention capturing tool. So we've made it work, but again, it's not ideal. And as, as people have attested to, having information in multiple systems is not a great thing. Um, Nancy also mentioned EduClimber. I believe that contract is lapsing at the end of this year because Panorama does also include some data display pieces that would replace what we were currently using EduClimber for. So the immediate impact that I would see 
Um, starting next year is we would no longer be using TSAR to capture intervention information. We would no longer be using the Infinite Campus RTI tab. I'm not sure about the PLP timeline quite yet. And then EduClimber contract would lapse at the end of this year, so we would no longer be using that tool. Okay, thank you. Brian? And just a follow-up from what I asked last week, or our last meeting as well. Uh, with NICU, as far as accommodations for students that receive services with their IEP, um, both on state assessments and during classroom assessments, those, those options are also available for like masking answers, text-to-speech, things like that as well. Following. Sorry, Steve. Following, you know, the accommodations that would be listed for the forward exam as kind of the basis for it. We would look to include everything that um, you would include on in an IEP. And the nice thing about, so we're switching gears. I hope that's okay. Yeah, well, that's all right. Naiku's up. This is great. So um, by the way, Naiku means teacher, if you're curious about what, what it meant. So that's one thing I really like about that tool um, is that it's about the teacher and not necessarily just about the assessment with the Naiku company. But be that as it may, it, it functions within a Chrome web browser. So every accessibility option that you would have available in that Chrome web browser is also available on the tests that you would take in Naiku. Um, and we have not encountered a, uh, an accommodation request yet that we couldn't find a way to meet when we were giving an assessment in NICU. Anything else? Okay, thank you very much. And then we will continue on. Uh, we'll continue on to assessment task force. As you can see, the three of us spend a lot of time together. <laughs> Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, as I stated in the memo, I believe it was Valentine's Day that the board asked us to uh, convene um, a review of the district's current assessment calendar. And so we did pull together a task force and members um, to begin that work. And your ask of us was to reduce the um, current number of assessments uh, by approximately 25%, and then to come back to you with recommendations from that task force by August 9th. And so in doing so, um, I felt it was important that we bring this during the process. We have just really begun the sessions. We've had uh, one large session and one, um, so we call them small groups. The meetings are set up in this then the platform that we're using would be a pre-K 12 large group. And then more specific to grade level work would come in the, what we call a small group, uh, PK eight. However, the high school are really enjoying this. So they're coming even though they don't have to come to this. So um, it's been one, the positive piece, this is the first time in the district that we've sat down and looked at assessment in a continuum of learning from pre-K to 12. And um, the dialogue in the small groups are, are really beneficial and really built in professional learning for everyone to speak about the different types of assessment and learning that happens at different stages in a student's educational experience. Um, one way and one ask of you is to get as many voices as we possibly could. And there's no better way to get voice than that good old survey methodology. And so we had a survey uh, written. Um, we we actually um, distributed uh, 2001 of the surveys at a fantastic return. Um, we had uh, 1,268 stakeholders that returned, to the returned the survey. We used the survey for a couple of pieces and the power of this survey is we don't have to, there's no perception to it. Either the teachers, the way it's written, the teachers do it or they don't do it. They just, yep, this is what they do, or this isn't what they do, or this is how they use it, or it isn't how they use it. So that the constituents who are the representatives as members of the working task force always have access to what their colleagues in that grade level have reported out during that survey. And so it's just another tool for the task force members to make a decision around as they um, bring forward those recommendations. 
So a little bit about um, that. And by the way, that's a 63% return. That's phenomenal. It's also the way that we um, captured who wanted to be a part of the internal working task force. And then we looked as a team to balance that. So we had representatives from a majority was asked for classroom teachers and then representatives across the district pre-K-12 and then from various different um, services uh, and teachers that provide services and use the data uh, throughout the district. Any questions so far on, and I can keep going, but if you have any direct questions that you'd like me to address, I certainly can. I'm gonna go ahead. So um, the um, task force membership, um, just to make sure that we are within your guidelines, uh, Vicki invited us to the GBA um, weekly meeting and they provided oversight or in input to what the membership was. And they um, really confirmed that there was a nice balance of membership there. Um, and then the, I, had a little, I have explained the, I hope the structure there will be four large group sessions, and now we're only down to two small group sessions. We did postpone or cancel one of those sessions. Uh, there was a conflict with the um, GBA um, end of year retirement celebrations. And so trying to rearrange these schedules for multiple people, 30 some people, almost impossible at this time of the year. And so we decided that we would just postpone that and then there will be work for those small groups to do in between the two week break. Um, and then uh, basically our first step in any task force is really to establish those norms and then make sure we're all grounded in the same purpose and why we're there. And the purpose that we're there um, is to first determine what our stakeholders needs are around the assessment for the funding, for the reporting, for what do all our stakeholders need? And then to go back and say, what are the least number of assessments that we can give to meet all of those needs? And you're all aware that state assessments and so on and so forth, we, those are told and, and, and determined by the Department of Public Instruction, as well as the other, the other side of the spectrum of the three big buckets of assessments. And that those are the formative assessments, which are really determined by the, the teachers. Those that, are, that, those that are instructing students, they use that type of an assessment to inform their instruction. That is, we, we mentioned them and we had the teachers go through an activity and they listed all of them, only to come to realize that, well, there's a lot, but not everyone uses the same ones. No, it's, it's really up to the teacher to use that type of formative assessment to give them the information they need to inform student learning. So what we're really working on is what we call those interim assessments. And when we came to the board, we that's our curriculum map, the windows the where students are, where teachers have to give assessments three times a year within a period of time. That seems to be where the, the most, the body of this work is really going to evolve too. And that will really come, um, actually the 12th, this Thursday, is where we really start working into those interim assessments. And um, I'm most certain um, from the results of the survey and the conversations we've had with our team members, that uh, task team members, task force team members, that that is the sweet spot that they really, we really need to dig into and look at what do we actually need? What are the fewest number of assessments that we can use to meet all those stakeholders' needs? So the task force, I'm gonna move on to the next steps, and okay? Unless anybody has any questions. Uh, the next uh, steps, um, what we'll be doing is the task force is gonna work through this process. And um, actually it's right in the middle of June, um, we would, and we're, we're confident that they're gonna come up with recommendations. And when the task force brings forward those recommendations, then we're gonna capture those recommendations. We're gonna format them into when we'll make another, Dr. Stramp will make another survey with those recommendations. And we will push that recommendation out to all the stakeholders again, so that they, they see what recommendations that their colleagues brought forward as a recommendation to reduce the number of assessments used in the district. Then but once we get that data back, 
that will be part of our final report that we submit. And um, like all good democracies, um, the, the, the vote that gets the, the, the um, recommendation that receives the greatest number of votes will be those that the task force members then will push forward as the recommendation for you to take action on. All right, uh, questions? Um, I guess I'll, I'll start with one. Um, what, um, so what happens if, I, and I, I like, I like what I'm hearing about the, you know, the role of this committee and the uh, task force and the task force's ability to take a stand. What happens if a majority of, um, if a majority of the committee wants to make changes that the administrative perspective feels that we can't maybe do all of those changes or should do some different ones. But what, 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 how does, how would that look? How would that be presented? Well, that's what I believe the power of it. That's an excellent question. That's the power of the task force. As we work together collaboratively, we build a common understanding and a depth of understanding of what the district needs as an assessment system, not what perhaps what uh, administrators typically represent what the needs of the district would be because of different commitment, legal commitments and so on and so forth. Um, that they, these may not be in uh, the, what we all agree upon on, you know, any of the task force members are hundred percent into the, you know, this was, it's a give and take. It's a really strategically working through how can we have the fewest number of assessments, but yet meet all of this stakeholders needs in the district, such as our legal obligation our grants or so forth and our reports and do the teachers need, what do the teachers need in order to know that their uh, students are making progress from the beginning of the year to the middle of the year adjustments made with all the other assessments and teaching they do. And then of course the summative at the end of the year. So it's a really, we're looking at the, I would say the progress monitoring heart of an, of an assessment system. So to your point, Andrew, there is no one person that will have a voice. This is done by committee, it's voted on by committee and we will work through it as a committee. Um, again, if, if this is, if this is a direction where this this committee or this this work this work session has the authority to determine what's going to go for to the board about what assessments are being kept or not, even if um, if if the administration is delegating that to the committee in such a way that if a the committee which is majority teacher. Uh, prefers a slightly different direction than what senior administration may have preferred, and we're going to go with the, the committee anyways. That is um, uh, impressive. Um, of course, we would still, I, I think, uh, we would still need to hear from you, obviously, if the committee report did a majority, uh, unlikely though it is, right? A committee could have a majority report that overlooks some detail that could cost us to lose funding, but um, I am. Happy to hear that. The only other question I had was there, there's a reference to reducing reducing by 25%. Uh, where did that come from? That, that actually came from the board. Um, a motion on the 14th? Okay, I was looking for it and I didn't, I didn't find it, but. Um, it's very specifically mentioned in the motion. Okay, it was it at least 20? I'm assuming it was at least 25, probably, because otherwise, that's pretty, otherwise it would be pretty. Okay, all right, thank you. I have no further, uh, Laura? Um, as you make your way through this process, um, will there be discussion, or maybe there already has been discussion on how to improve the assessments that we, that we want to keep, like how, like efficiencies or saving time for teachers or, I don't know. I, I, I'm imagining that that kind of will come up as well. You're absolutely correct. And I believe we're entering that part of the process starting in large session two. Um, be, as we go through the process, it, you, you, they will weed out, they will work through, is it the assessment or is it the, the demands on 
administering the assessment in monitoring the assessment. That will all be brought through as part of, so we begin with the assessments we currently have. Uh, and I believe um, in the motion, you also asked or in a follow-up conversation, um, it was provided for me to me that um, you also asked of us to report out on the process we are going to use to accomplish just that. And so what process are we actually going to be using to make sure that we address the assessments that we have? And again, I'm gonna to go to our interim assessments because that, that's your assessment calendar for the most part that we had the discrepancies in or the, the um, I guess that's where the heat is right now, the pushback. And so we wanna address that, right? And so we, not only is it the assessment that we're addressing, it would, it would be all the other elements of why that assessment would be. And that's the beautiful part is there are five questions we always ask ourselves. Money was one, the connection to the Board of Education's uh, strategic plan, the federal grants that are, uh, that are out there, the community and stakeholders. These are all questions that your task force members have to filter through when they're working through which stay on and which come off. So there's a, we keep, well, what we really do is facilitate and give them more tools. So they have the survey as a tool. They have actually, we call the filter that they go through because that's what, you have, that's what we do in system work. We have to make sure that we take in consideration the cost, what the board's direction for the district is, what the state and federal laws are, you know, the, um, the impact that that assessment's gonna have on other components of the district. So in other content areas and other components of the district, and they're really taking a broad look at what the assessment's used for, the cost of what that assessment might be, the time element, that will really get into the, I wanna say the weeds with that in our large group session two. Um, if we would have had a small group session two, that's really where it starts to come together in task force work, but we're pretty excited. This is just a wonderful group of educators to be working with, fantastic attitude. Um, they, they want what's best and they want what's best for our children. And it's always easy to circle around that wagon. So pretty exciting. I, um, I just, we have a task force. We're not going to do this every single year. So now that we have this task force, and I, I agree, I thought the list of people on it, very impressive. Um, you know, we have a mission, but that looking at it um, in a more expansive way, seems like now's the time to do that. So um, I just wanted to mention about, about the ones we're gonna keep, how can we make them better? <laughs> so. Yeah, and absolutely, Laura, it's a fantastic question. And that is absolutely part of a, the depth that you go in a task force. Again, those closest to the work, the end user, it needs to be user friendly for the end user, yet meaningful and meet all stakeholders' needs. Thank you. you bet. Uh, anything else on that? All right, then we'll uh, move ahead to the GBAPS online PK6 overview. Uh, Mr. Becker, I hate to do this, but I also want to recognize Mr. Miller. This is probably his last board meeting with the district. He's taken on a principal position uh, outside of GBAPS, but he's led our assessment work for as long as I've known him and uh, done a really outstanding job with it. So wanted to recognize you, Stephen. Right. Uh, I want to turn it over. Thank you, Mr. Becker. I want to turn it over to Adam and Andrea. Um, as you know, they came to a recent board meeting to talk about naming process for our online elementary school. And Adam wants to talk about that and roll out his plan to do so. Adam? Okay, thanks, Vicki. Um, and we kind of met with Laura and she said, you know, um, could we give the kind of board an overview of the online school as a whole? Um, so this is just kind of a brief overview, um, but then also talking a little bit about our next step, uh, steps for the naming process. So you, I believe you have a presentation um, that is linked in the agenda um, that I will go through. But really it all kind of started with, with a philosophy or an idea. Um, we all kind of do virtual learning as pandemic learning, um, and that worked for some students, but we wanted to really create a sustainable online school. 
um, that met the needs of students. So we, we kind of use this philosophy and it's to put students at the center of the learning and create a variety of learning experiences utilizing technology uh, to help meet and ex help students meet and exceed grade level expectations. Um, throughout the presentation, you will notice different ways that we have utilized technology. Um, these are all student pictures or student work as well. Uh, moving on to, so one of the things that uh, overall is, if you look, there's not a whole lot of elementary um, online schools, um, but we felt like we had some things that we felt were really important to guide our decision making. Um, one thing that we felt was that we have strong student, family, and school partnerships to create a collaborative learning experience. So some things that we did with that is all of our students and families uh, participated in a orientation meeting with me or one of my administrative teams, um, just so that they had an understanding of our program and we were able to get to know them better. And during that time, we um, also talked about something called the learning coach, and that is the adult that is at home that supports the child's learning during uh, the school day, because we felt that was extremely crucial. Um, within that partnership also, we knew that as this being a new program, we needed family feedback. Um, so we were constantly working with families to get feedback, um, sometimes through surveys, but sometimes literally right there on the spot. Um, and then the other big thing was um, looking at COVID and how it was done. We realized that that structure probably was not going to work for a sustainable online school. So what we did is we kind of created an innovative personalized schedule to obtain the universal curriculum and differentiated instruction to meet individual needs. Um, so each of our students has an individualized structure based on their needs. Um, they utilize Google Calendar where they come and go throughout the day and, and um, kind of participate in a variety of different activities that are on the next slide, where we essentially have three different modes of education. Um, we have synchronous when the students are together. Um, that could be community circle, number corner, small group instruction, individual conferring, social learning, uh, student talking interaction. Um, interactive read alouds and interactive writing. Um, I will let you know in our synchronous time, majority of that would be done in small groups of two to three, maybe four students. Large group only for the most part happens during community circle and number corner. Part of that reason is we realize that uh, the smaller the group, the increase the amount of engagement and uh, participation of students. So we wanna increase that amount of time. Then we also have asynchronous work and that is work that, that our students are doing not specifically with the teacher involved. Um, but it is stuff that they are still able to do on, on the computer. Um, and then lastly, we did feel like there was a strong component of all, we wanted our students to not always be in front of the computer. Uh, we started with a, a principle of like three hours a day of, of on computer time. Um, I would say that, I, as I said to all families, that is a goal. Um, I don't know as we continue to explore that. Um, we, I don't know how close we are, but um, to that, but we, do believe that there's enough activities that we need to be sending home that can also be done off the computer. Um, this next slide, kind of, I think in, in, a, uh, in one slide or one picture kind of visualizes the, um, I'm just kind of, kind of encompasses what we are able to do. Um, two of my teachers are, I, my group of teachers came and said, hey, we think this would be a really good idea it would be to put up a, a map of, of the United States and kind of push, um, put pins on of where our students are currently being taught from. And then I said, well, why don't we do it virtually? Um, so right now on this slide, um, we may not have one in every, all, they may not be there currently always, but these are different spots that we have taught students in throughout the United States and in Mexico as well, in Jamaica. Um, so at any given time, we can be teaching students throughout the, throughout the uh, entire United States. Um, which has also allowed us to really build those relationships, but have a continuous model of learning, no matter what's going on in our families' uh, lives. So our next steps uh, as, as we continue to move forward and we're finishing up this first year is um, we want to, as we talked about at our last board meeting, marketing and branding, naming process. We really need to get, we want to get our name out there. We think we're offering this exceptional, innovative schooling, and we want to make sure people are aware of it but also know, um, you know, we have a name and a brand that goes with that. Um, we want to, we will be expanding to sixth grade. Um, so next year we will take on a sixth grade. So our students in fifth grade will roll into sixth grade. We, we believe that um, it's important to offer that same level of education and support, and we're seeing a lot of success with it. And then we're going to continue to develop programming and experiences to meet the needs and 
the academic and social needs of all of our students. Moving into our naming process timeline, um, last week I met with Laura and James and we sent out some communication to families and community members uh, to see who would like to be on the naming committee. Um, I met with some teachers to solicit that and then we also will be working with some fifth grade students to join our committee. Um, between now and the 27th, our goal is to have two committee meetings um, where we are able to work through that committee process of exploring names um, and then coming up with three that we're able to recommend to the board uh, for on June 13th for discussion and public comment and then hopefully having a final recommendation where the board would vote on June 27th. Wondering at this time, if you have any questions. Um, Brian? Um, Adam, in regards to the slide where the students are learning, are those students that are enrolled from that area or are they Green Bay students who may be visiting and or you know, grandma and grandpa's in Minnesota or are they full-time learning in those locations? Um, so those are all Green Bay resident students or Wisconsin resident students through open enrollment. Um, really by doing this job, it opened up to, to see a whole different varieties. We have some families that uh, mom is a traveling nurse. Um, so that student is there for a period of time. We have families that travel back to Mexico for a period of time. Um, we have families that are, are during the pandemic were, were in Jamaica because that was a good place for them to be. So um, they all of them have to have re residency in Wisconsin as part of, because we are Wisconsin public school. Um, but they could be there from a short period of time to, to a month. Right, uh, other, uh, Dawn? So you're expanding up to sixth grade next year. Are you looking at expanding enrollment outside of adding sixth grade? I mean, I think the, we, as we continue to grow and build the program, we wanna make sure that we're offering programming that meets the needs of students. So if we are continuing to build that programming and it's gonna be as successful as what I, we all think it can be, um, I think that is definitely something that will be explored as we continue to move because we definitely wanna to continue to provide that programming for those students that are seeing that success and not only provide it, but build upon it. Awesome. So I, yes, I did go and visit the school last week, um, which was very interesting, a real pleasure. Um, and uh, it was just really good to see the facilities that have been built out in order to accommodate this new school. Um, I, I, a couple of things that really stuck with me. One was that Adam mentioned to me that I, I got to go into the, these uh, rooms as teachers were teaching. And these, um, he said that this work attracts veteran teachers. Um, which I thought was a really interesting uh, phenomenon. You sort of explained that, that to me, but these are, these are teachers with a lot of year, uh, years in, um, and they um, are adept and comfortable in this, in this kind of setting. That, I found that really interesting. And then the other thing was that you mentioned, Adam, that, that some of these children have made two, year, two years of academic growth. Um, in this in this school year, um, that's that's profound, and I, I was really impressed with that. I mean, it's not every student, but there, that, but it it has happened with some of the students from this school. So um, those stuck with me, and I just wanted to share them. And also, thank you very much for giving me a tour. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we have seen um, the final numbers are still we're still waiting to, but we have seen a lot of of some tremendous growth with our students. And I think it is the model um, where students are really getting individualized learning experiences um, to, to push them. Um, it's 50% of my first grade class has made two years worth of growth. Um, 75 have made a year and a half or more. Um, so, and, and really the success of this school is due to the teachers. Um, they have done an amazing job taking an idea and a philosophy and building it and growing it and taking feedback and adapting and just being flexible. So, um, you know, they've gotten to essentially work to create a school that they feel could really meet the needs of all students. Yeah. Uh, Brian? 
Adam, I tried to find this online. I'm looking at your screen with the cameras over there, sorry. Um, what percentage of students are open enrolled compared to Green Bay students? I would have to get back to you on that um, to give you an exact number. Um, but I would say well over a majority are Green Bay students. I would say maybe 10 to 15 are open enrolled. Um, but now I know that is we are going through that process again and we are continuing to reevaluate um, and, and people are applying. I think a big part of our branding, our next steps of our name is very important to get our name out there um, because we wanna make sure people understand what we're offering because uh, it is a very different experience than other um, online schools. I would agree. Uh, I was impressed, uh, like Laura, with what I saw, and it uh, it was very different than what I expected, actually. Um, and to the question of expanding, uh, one thing that I walked away from was um, it is bound to some um, common understanding of classroom size. And the, their goal is not to expand and have one teacher teach 200, 300 people and you know minimize the amount of contact and, and rely on coaches but really just create a classroom without walls but you know keep maintain those ratios that respect the those norms um but also um, the branding um process is really compressed on schedule um uh, as adam said it's necessary because uh I was inquisitive and curious as to what the niche was and uh, providing this school to current homeschooling families. It's very different to be a coach versus the primary educator uh, for um, uh, homeschooled individuals. And this just jumped off the page as a very viable alternative to those Green Bay families. But if you say online school, I don't think you're gonna get them there. Right. So you really have to make sure that this branding speaks to that demographic. Um, so I recognize the committee process and the policy that drives the committee process. But whatever we can do to make sure that we get this right, um, I, I would encourage us to do, whether it is engaging an outside consultant for a period of time or whatever, to make sure that uh, we do a thorough job. Brian. And I don't know if this question would be for Vicki or for Adam on this. Is this something that we could also eventually package and offer to other districts in the area as serving, servicing the needs of their students through open enrollment, but have a former partnership with them and other districts in the areas kind of work with other online schools and partnerships with them as far as providing some services to them? Is that something that is in the plans or something that you would see as a feasible option? We haven't discussed that at this point, Brian. Um, I think what Adam has created is something that uh, certainly is a selling point for students in other districts. We haven't talked about partnering with other districts. Um, maybe we can look into that next year a little bit. But my hope is that families that are struggling in in the area might want to come to Green Bay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, anything else? Okay, uh, and that was the final item on the uh, education work session. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we are now going to move on to um, item five, policy and governance. We have a whole bunch of policies. Um, be before we start, I just want to say um, thank you, Melissa, for making this chart, <laughs> this handy dandy chart. Um, very helpful to see, see it all in one document um, with a small little synopsis of, of what of the summary um, element of, of each one of these proposed rules, um, policies. So uh, but with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, be facilitated by Laura Layton and Warren. Thank you. Uh, we will just go through um, each of these and then I'll, I'll state the, the policy and the number and the title and then I'll turn it over to Melissa. So the first one is policy 425 part time public school open enrollment. And just for a little introduction just to give 
James and Brian a little bit of background as to how we got here and why we're going in this format and in this in this way. Um, so when I came in 2013 to the district, the district had uh, subscribed to the model policies from the Wisconsin Association of School Boards. There's a number of different services school districts can subscribe to for model policies. You get the policies, you get the updates, they give you legislative updates that um, uh, impact the policies, and then you get to change them to adapt them to your district. When I came in 2013, the district had um, subscribed to WSB's policies, but they were a letter series. So things were like A, A, B, A, and those, they were various different chapters based on the alphabet. The district was in the process of working with WASB to update and convert those letter policies to the number series that you see today on board docs. They hadn't gotten all the way through, but that work had begun and it was taking a long time. Preferably school districts would have in place a policy review rotation so that you're reviewing policies every two to five years. Green Bay didn't have that when I came in 2013. And because we were still updating and getting through all of that work, we weren't able to implement a review cycle. When we moved to the committee structure, that was really the opportune time for us to try again to get that review cycle in place. So we started that this year. We have, um, we, we've been very uh, adventurous in how many policy series we've gotten done this year. We have gotten through the 600 series, which is the fiscal policies, the 900 series that deal with a lot of the facilities work. There's not a lot in the 900 series. Then we started on the 500 series, which is the human resources uh, policies. And there was a lot of work to be done in that section. And now tonight we have the 700 series, which is the support services. So now that we have the series of policies that really needed the most work, mm -hmm. starting with 22-23, we're gonna start on our rotation. So for 22-23, we're gonna do 100s and 200s. Um, I think about four or five years ago, Andrew was here when this uh, occurred, we reviewed the 100 and 200 series. So those won't be as hopefully as much work as the policies that we've had to do this year. But now that we're getting on a cycle, I'm, I'm hopeful other than the legislative changes that we will be seeing these policies more frequently. Brian? Just a logistics question. The, the most efficient way to look at this would be the series review considerations sheet. Your phone didn't get that. Am I correct on that, Melissa, that the 700 series, the series review consideration is going to be the most beneficial. Yes, we'll walk through, um, we'll go through the table and I'll introduce the policies. And then if you have reviewed them or have any questions, we'll just take them one by one. Okay. And the other thing to point out too, policies have a policy and an administrative rule. The policy is really the board's work. That's the governance document. That's your um, the, the way that the board lets its stakeholders know your view on that particular topic. A rule is the administrative implementation of the rule. We're not required to bring changes to the rule to the board. When we do whole scale changes to the rule and the accompanying policy, we do typically bring it so that you understand what the changes will be with respect to the administrative rule. Um, so because we did the 700 series, we have brought all of those rules forward where there's going to be minor changes. But if those were just one-off changes that needed to happen, we wouldn't be required to bring those to the board. Beth, can you remind the board where they can get that table? Yep, it's uploaded under every line item of the 700 series and it's called series review considerations it's this same document just a hundred times yep thank you <laughs> okay but before we get into the 700s the first one on our agenda is part-time public school open enrollment um, if you've been playing along with the legislature over the last 10 years, they have gone back and forth, back and forth, back and forth with respect to the various different structures for open enrollment. Uh, part-time open enrollment got morphed into a number of different things. We are back to part-time open enrollment. So this policy you'll see on the um, updated list where we track the dates of how often we change things. This one's been updated a number of times. So when we updated this with the last legislative change, uh, it looked a little bit different here in the district as to what personnel were responsible for various different tasks. As we've worked through this process and this procedure, uh, we, I think we've now gotten into a good groove 
So the changes really just reflect who is doing the work with respect to the part-time open enrollment policy. Any questions on that one? Okay, now we'll move on to 720, Procedures for Student Security. And as was pointed out within that, you'll see the 700 series review considerations. So in your chart, you have the policy number or the rule number, the title, the last time that policy rule was revised, so you can see the date. And then whether we are proposing that there be revisions or, or we're adopting a new policy and then the summary of either what that new policy is or a summary of the revisions. So with respect to rule 720, we are proposing a cha slight changes to this rule to reflect the frequency of the ALICE drills that are required by state law. And ALICE drills are drills that in 2018, if you remember that was when the, um, mass shooting in Florida occurred and a number of different legislative changes happened in Wisconsin that required a number of policies to be drafted or revised. This was one of them and this um, change just reflects the frequency of those ALICE drills. Any questions on this one? Okay, we'll move on to 720.1, building grounds and equipment security. This is a new policy we're proposing. Um, what's great about the WASB model policies is they give you a menu of all the policies that could possibly exist in a series. And then you choose the ones that apply to your district. Um, so we've had an opportunity in this cycle of review to look through the policies that we think we should have on the books um, to provide transparency to the taxpayers as well as provide um, information that the board would want the stakeholders to know. So this is one of those buildings, grounds and equipment security. Um, the security of our buildings is a critical comp component to our safety program, and this policy addresses the governance components of the security of the district's buildings, grounds, and equipment. Any questions on this one? Okay. Next, um, 720.2 identification badges. This is another um, new policy. So some of our policy, policies had referred in the safety program policies had referred to the wearing of safety badges, but didn't provide explicit details as to how you get those badges, who's required to wear them, um, when you're required to wear them, those sorts of things, replacement. So we uh, have drafted a policy that provides the importance of wearing those um, safety badges, those, I'm sorry, identification badges, and then addresses those governance components of wearing those for students, staff, visitors, and vendors, and um, when they're required to be worn during the regular school day. James? I have a quick question that's generalized and I won't have to ask it again. In reading the policies, none of them really address codifying or recording or records retention. So this one says visitors need to check in and register, but it doesn't in, as policy say that those records will be kept for a period of time. Do you relegate all of that to procedures or is there any policy statement around that? That's a very good question. We do have a policy and I cannot remember the number off the top of my head. I wanna say it's 347, but we adopted the, in policy, the board has adopted the Wisconsin um, Department of Public Instruction records retention requirements. And I can get you that chart, but in the DPI's record retention guidelines, it explicitly details, I'd say 200 different records that a school district has and then what the retention schedule is. And if it's not itemized in that retention schedule, then the default is seven years per uh, Wisconsin record retention requirements. Is it reasonable to, um, to think that if there is no um, speak of any kind of record retention is either covered by that one policy or you've adopted that no records need to be kept? So Alice training was the 720, you have to, train it twice a year, whatever, but there's no um, mention of recording the training or who was absent or whatever. There is either in that policy, I can find the record and the retention or there's no 
no requirement. So the great thing is the Wisconsin legislature creates all these statutes that have all different requirements. So with respect to Alice, there's a specific process for recording those trainings. And then that comes to the board. Um, I don't I don't think it came at your last meeting. It comes to the board for your approval. You review every single one of those drills and then you have to approve that. And then Chris Collar, the um, safety and security coordinator forwards that on to the state. So there's a very specific record retention requirement for that. And there are for other things um, in the district. And then it's our job to make sure we're on top of those and recording those records in, re in response to the statutory requirements. Any other questions? Okay, we'll move on to 721, Building and Grounds Management, Maintenance and Inspection. This is a, another new policy. Um, Mike was here tonight to talk about what that looks like from an implementation um, standpoint. And this policy really just codifies what we've already been doing in the district, but provides those governance processes and procedures to that work that we do here in the district. Any questions? Okay, we'll move it on to 722.1. Reporting visitor accidents or injuries on district premises. The district currently has policy 70, 722 in place that applies to students and staff with reporting accidents and injuries. We did not have a policy that addressed how that looked for visitors. Of course it gets done, but we didn't have a policy in place. So this policy just sets forth that process as well as the, as well as the governance components around reporting of those accidents and injuries to visitors. James? Is there in another policy the definition of substantial? Because I think we are to report or hear about substantial injuries. Or is it just uh, at the moment in time consideration for what do you think needs to be reported to the board? I will look in the other policies. That's a really good point about having a de definition in the policy with respect to substantial injury. So I can, we can add that. Thank you. Okay, 723, school safety plans. This policy was changed to update the change in the Wisconsin assessment threat protocol, which came out um, just to update different um, requirements set forth in that threat protocol. That's all dictated by the state as to what needs to be in your threat protocol. And then we've also revised the policy to note that school safety plans are provided electronically. Another upside to COVID was that many of these documents were placed on our intranet and other ways for staff to be able to access them when you're not physically in a classroom. And so now everything is electronically with respect to those school safety plans. Any questions? Okay, we'll move it on to 723.4 crisis management. A number of years ago, the um, district officially adopted the NIMS crisis management system in order to manage various different crises in the district. This policy provides the governance components to crisis management and also sets forth the process and the procedures that the district will use when managing a crisis. Any questions? Okay, moving on to 724, Indoor Environmental Quality Management. State law requires school districts to have and implement an indoor environmental quality management plan. This policy addresses those requirements and sets forth the management of indoor environmental quality. And to James, to your question before, there's also various different record retention requirements under this law as well. So we follow those statutory requirements. Thank you, any questions? Um, next, 725, 
asbestos management? Similar to the um, indoor environmental quality management, we also have to have an asbestos management plan on file and follow that through the state and retain various different records. This policy codifies that as well. Questions? Okay, 726, chemical hygiene plan, hygiene management. If you were here a number of years ago, we had a mercury leak in the district. So not only did we get to implement our crisis management, but we also got to implement our chemical hygiene plan. Um, we have had a chemical hygiene plan on the books, but it also going through that process opened our eyes and ears as to various different chemicals that had been staying in science rooms and working with our chemical hygiene officers and our various different uh, secondary schools to get those out of our, our schools. So this policy, just um, similar to the previous two, codifies those statutory requirements and sets forth what we are legally obligated to do with respect to chemical hygiene maintenance. Any questions? Okay, 731, privacy in locker rooms, restrooms, and designated changing areas. So if you've been following along on how these policies are structured, um, as we have done the revisions, we also wanted to make sure that we have a standard formatting in the policies so that they flow and that everyone can know where to expect the definitions, the implementation, those sorts of things when you go to read them. This policy was brought into that standard formatting. But in addition to that, we also clarified that privacy doesn't just apply to locker rooms, it applies to restrooms and other designated changing areas so that students also understand that they have those rights when they are not in a traditional locker room. Any questions? 732, use of unmanned aircraft, drones. I think this is my favorite one in the 700 series. I wrote a policy about a drone. Uh, there are federal and state rules regarding the flying of drones and um, Mike's facilities department uses drones when we are doing our referendum projects and when we're doing various different uh, buildings and grounds work and our students are using drones as well in, the, in their classrooms. So in order to make sure that we're not violating um, federal airspace requirements or other state laws, this policy sets forth what those processes and procedures are. Brian? You were excited to write the policy, now I have a question about it. The WIA requires, um, bans the use of drones during sporting events. So if there's other policies by groups that we partner with, for instance, if there's a football game, the officials are required to stop the game until the drone disappears. Does that go to, the, does the board policy go to the most restrictive part of it? In other words, are officials allowed to still stop that and not have some coach say, well, policy 732, allows me to have this because it's an educational purpose. So I believe in here we did adopt the WIA's restrictions. Let me just go back and look. Okay, but I, I'm almost positive we adopted WIA's restrictions and it's really for safety as well as the various different rules around broadcasting student um, sports and, and activities. Thank you. Um, 733, energy management. This policy was last uh, revised in 2006. So we revised it to bring in alignment with our standard policy formatting as well as to update it for legal requirements. Any questions? All right, 751, student transportation services. I think we forgot 733 rule. So again, that was same with the policy um, to revise that rule to bring it in alignment with the formatting and update the legal requirements. Okay, the next one, student transportation services. Uh, I wanna thank Chad for working on all of these because these were um, a lot of work. It looks like a substantial changes to the transportation policies, largely revised to bring it a standard formatting as well as to just really update to reflect our current practices and procedures. So that's what you'll see with respect to policy 751. And then anything different with the rule for 751? 
same changes, same reason for the changes. Any questions? Okay, um, 751 bus safe, 751.1 bus safety program. The purpose of this policy is to address our safety program and the governance components of that program and make sure that our contractors are aware of what the requirements are as well as our parents and students. Any questions? Okay. 751.2, use of electronic surveillance technology on school bus. This policy was um, last revised in 2015 and it has been revised to bring in alignment with our policy formatting as well as update the legal requirements. Any questions? Okay, 751.4, transportation contractors. This is a new policy that uh, we are bringing forward to reflect the contract requirements for, for our um, transportation carriers, as well as what the district's obligations are, and then how concerns regarding those transportation contractors would come forward for a governance um, point of view. Any questions? Okay, 751.5. Use of alternative vehicles to transport students. This policy uh, was last um, revised in 2014, so we're bringing it forward to bring it in alignment with our policy formatting as well as updating the legal requirements. Okay, any questions? Okay, we'll move on to um, the rule, the same um, 751.5. Same reason for those changes as well. 751.6, co-curricular student transportation. We are recommending that we repeal 751.6 and then just move that information into 751.7. Uh, a lot of the language that currently exists is duplicative and really co-curricular trips are treated very similar to field trips. And so it didn't make sense to have a redundant policy that essentially states the same thing. Stephanie, would anyone have questions about the repeal or being incorporated into 751.7? Okay. If you still need to go over anything with 751, okay. Okay, moving right along, we're getting there, folks. Um, 762, vending machines. This is a new policy. Um, actually, the accounting department requested this policy. We have vending machines in a number of our buildings and how those vending machines are treated with respect to our nutritional requirements, as well as where the proceeds from those vending machines go because we are governed by the DPI's um, accounting procedures. We needed to make sure that we are in compliance with that. So this is why we're bringing forward a policy about vending machines. Any questions? Okay, um, 773, use of electronic signatures. Another upside to COVID was that we have really resorted to the ability to have electronic signatures on district documents. Uh, it's been very parent friendly and we have gone leaps and bounds with the ability to do that over the two years of COVID. There are statutory requirements for what's a valid electronic signature. So this policy sets forth what is required in the district to have a valid electronic signature as well as authorizes an electronic signature by the board. Any questions? Okay, moving on to 780, insurance management. So this is it. Um, our last policy is with respect to the board's authority to require an insurance program in the district and to adequately address the safeguarding of the community's investment in district property, health and safety, and providing for replacement of district property when losses occur. Any questions? If I could just add also on then on the chart are the policies that were reviewed, but I just want to make sure that you know that we're not recommending any changes. And the reason for um, not making those changes is included on that chart. One thing we are have been adding as we've been going through this process 
is when the policy was last reviewed. So if it has a, a date that looks like it's been sitting on the books for a number of years, by adding that review date, the public is aware that it just hasn't gone stale, that we have looked at it, but it does accurately reflect the practices and procedures and the board's governance position with respect to that policy. Thank you. It's a lot of a lot of work and um, a lot of time and effort went into it. I can see that, so thank you. Then I'll bring these back uh, for the regular board meeting. I'll make the change that uh, James had suggested with adding that definition. So you'll see that in the policy and then we'll be able to approve these at the main board meeting. Thank you, Melissa. Um, these policies, all our policies um, are so foundational to the work we do. So I just uh, always appreciate, appreciate when you come before us and talk about these policies. It's also a good reminder of, of how, how regulated public education is and and how much we how seriously we take things like safety you know all these things that that parents i um sometimes lose sleep over and uh and that we're, we're paying attention to it the way we should thank you okay thank you laura all right so um we are now moving on to number six uh it, that is uh, just uh, um, our, our schedule uh, going forward. And then anybody have any questions about any of that? And then um, I would just, could someone please uh, read the motion to go into closed session? Go ahead, Brian. Make the motion that the board convenes in closed session pursuant to Wisconsin statute 19.851C to consider employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over whom the board has jurisdiction. Wisconsin statute 19.851F to consider financial, medical, social, or personal histories, which if discussed in public would likely would be likely to have a substantial adverse effect upon the reputation of persons referred to specifically to discuss the superintendent and interim superintendent's administrative contracts. Do we have a second? Second. Beth, do we need to do a vote vote? Okay, go ahead. Becker. Aye. Welch. Aye. Larry. Aye. Smith. Aye. McCoy. Aye. Aiden and Warren. Aye. Mills. Aye. Uh, motion passes 7-0. Uh, we will adjourn across the hall to the small conference room.